I'm sure we're good now. See, uh, right. you're hitting on me. Like, am I? Is it cold over there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! What the fuck is wrong with you, bro? I'm. Not, I'm I, I was asking if it was cold. I was asking about the weather. <laughs> you don't have to be sensitive about. I was just asking about the weather. Okay, so yes, it's actually like it snowed yesterday. I don't know because sometimes I I. Sometimes I, you know, if even if it's not cold, sometimes I have a reaction as though it's cold. <laughs> um, so I, I was, how do you like how do you like London? First of all, I'm so happy to have you. You, I feel like this, you know, this podcast is my excuse to talk to my most interesting uh, friends, the most interesting people I know, and you are definitely one of the most interesting, not even one of, like perhaps the most interesting. I was going to say, like, am I like at least top three, two, one? Oh, you're, well, you have just such a unique, I feel like you're always in the right place at the right time. Really? You have a very, yeah, I, you have a very unique everything. Like I remember um, I was watching, I was like, I think my barber was playing the Kirko Bangs Drank in My Cup video, and I was like, and I saw you in, and I was like, oh, of course you're in the Drank in My Cup video. Like, that of course. is not true to anyone listening to this. I have no idea what he's talking about. I am not in the Kirko Bangs video. Um, every so often, once a year, this comes up, but it's completely not true. It's, it's a, do- <laughs> it's a, it's a do- is it a doppelganger? Like, who's in the video? It's someone who resembles. I truly have no idea. Someone who resembles you. Well, okay. So the, the goal of this podcast really is like, I feel like out there, somewhere out there, there's going to be somebody who's like, oh, wow. Like who comes across your Instagram page, who who comes across Matt Brand, who comes across, you know, just your life. And it's like, whoa, I want to do what she does. She's dope. And like kind of, you know, let us know how you got there. But at the same time, you're kind of a bad example for this because your your path is so unique. Like, I don't know that someone can replicate this. Like I have a friend who plays a uh, pro football and I was like, I have to switch it up for him because, like, what's he going to tell people? Oh, be born with really, really good genes to become a football player. Like, there's not really – I like there's certain people you can't really replicate. And you might be one of those people who is kind of unreplicatable. Because your, your path is so unique. Like, you were – like, you're from, like, what, Oklahoma, right? Arkansas. Okay. The, the South, whatever. Just non-Texas South, Arkansas. <laughs> it's, all, it's all the same to me. Um, but like, you're, like, from – I grew up in Houston yeah. since I was like six. But we have, yeah, we have a lot of mutual friends because we both grew up in Houston. But like, I mean, you worked at like, what? Did you work at like Hooters or something for a little bit? Like you have such a unique at, path. I worked at Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks. So uh, Hooters knockoff. Um, Hooters didn't at, hire me. They, wow. Look at them. Their loss. Uh, yeah. Like the Drake album, her loss. We also, we also have to talk about your disdain for Drake um, <laughs> because you just, I really don't know where it comes from. I like you're one of those people who I agree with almost all your takes, but this is just the one area where <laughs> this is the one area where we just don't, I don't know what it is. Dad, like whenever you see me like talking bad about Jake, do you think like, the fuck? like, well, it's just one of those things. It's like, I'm like, okay, I guess we can't agree on everything. Cause like okay. we do really, like, I feel like you're, I mean, you're so interesting. Cause I feel like entertainment is such a difficult place to be unorthodox. Like everyone kind of has to like, I think about like, 2016 lebron james beyonce Pusha t all supporting hillary clinton i'm like yo Pusha t you were a drug dealer i guess jay-z was jay-z was also a drug dealer but like it's like you know it's like how can you both be cool but also be like shilling for you know the establishment basically um and like you were one of the first people who i remember who was like kind of COVID skeptical like who was like yo like we're all gonna go crazy like this is not health i mean and like I'm not, you know, that's a very controversial thing. But like, you look at how much violent crime has risen, and I think there's also stats about depression and like suicides. But I mean, the one that is you can't deny is like violent crime. People are like really killing each other, and there's no, you know, I think people are gonna try to study what caused it because like it's not all crime; it's just violent crime that's really up. And I wonder how much of that is just like, yo, we were inside, people kind of lost their minds, and you were one of the first people. Sign- I think you lost your Twitter account over that. I mean, Elon, yeah. he- back. Um, but like you were one of the people who was like, yo, like this is not healthy. This is not natural at a time when like, I think everyone kind of evolved to kind of a little bit agree somewhat, but like you were saying that day one, like you were one, and like, you're just, it's rare to meet somebody in entertainment who one will believe that, but then also two will be willing to speak their mind because everyone is sort of, you know, 
I feel like I really sometimes I wonder, I'm like, is it that people just really don't know? I think some people don't know like how dangerous like the things that they like promote are. Like I'm falling further away from like people just like actually just being like villains. And I think that sometimes they just don't know like what they're promoting. And they're like, you know, so I think like with that, I had actually, I was in a depression in like 2019. Like I was going to therapy and my therapist actually um, diagnosed me clinically depressed. And I felt like I literally just pulled myself out of depression, like January 2020. So then here comes March 2020. And y'all are basically telling me that y'all are forcing me to go back into depression. And I was like, no, like literally everything that was being promoted. I'm like, this is like depressive. Like these are depressive habits that they're like causing people to create. And I definitely think that we're seeing the effects of it. I really talk about it all the time. Like music is not the same. So many things are just like completely different, but you know, I, it has to have been God's plan, right? Right. I mean, I think it's also like a lot of those things didn't like, for example, where it's like, Hey, like get, get off the beach. Cause now we know more about the virus and like the, well, we're going to get like sanctioned, but we know more about the virus and it's like outside is pretty relatively safe. Like sunlight is a, you know, like the idea of, Hey, get taking people say, Hey, get away from the beach, but you can go to Walmart. Right. Or get away from, they're filling in skate parks in California where it's like, actually you would want people to be outside. Um, I remember in Florida, there's this, this uh, lawyer who was like, you know, death Santis, you know, the Santis is killing people and, you know, the beach and whatever. And it's like, actually the, to be outside would be, you know, one of the better places to be uh, during this. And then also there was a weirdness of kind of, Everyone kind of getting behind the BLM right, uh, the BLM, wow, this is, the BLM protest. I almost said riots. This this is making me sound like I'm a MAGA. Uh, the BLM, I mean, some of them were riots, but the BLM protests where they're like, oh, actually, it's okay to to gather for that, but not to gather. So it kind of made people feel like, wait a second, are the health officials like, how can you kind of trust them if they're saying, you know, social distance or else you're killing grandma, but oh, also you can it's okay for the things that I support. Right. I think you, I don't know. I just yeah. thought it was really interesting. It was a very political climate where like it was, it was just so political and it was just so fake. And when I say political, I mean like um, performative, you know, cause I remember I knew this girl, I really had a problem with like social media influencers just blindly pushing this. And then it's so funny how people be like, oh yeah, you know, fight the power, fight the establishment. And then y'all go and push the things that they actually want you to push. And like, I knew this girl who was like, um, literally it's just such a like social media office. I mean, not social media, um, social distancing, like police officer. And she was like always posting on her story, like don't gather, don't gather, blah, 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 blah. And it was just pissing me off. And But we were actually friends. And one day she came to my house and she was just like, like me and her were going back and forth and she was like, yeah, you know, I take it very seriously. I only have like a pod. I only interact with pods, like, you know, which has four people in it and they only interact with pods that only have other four people in it and all this stuff. And she was just basically saying like, she keeps her circle small in order to like permit, permit the, you know, virus spreading. And I was like, but I'm not in your pod. Like, I'm like, you just came to my house. I'm outside of the four people. And my friend was there who was another person. It's a sixth person. And she's like, why? I mean, yeah. And it's like, this is what I'm talking about though. Like for your mental health, you chose to come over here and enjoy your day, but you want to like, it's just life is too fucking, life is too nuanced. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's, and it made me think like what you just said about like, you're going away from thinking people are just good or evil. And some people just don't know what they're like. I think that there's that sort of, and I hate to use the word woke, but there's that sort of idea of putting people in buckets of like, you're evil, you're good. And it's like, people are just complex, right? And I think about people who try to, you know, I have somebody here who, on the podcast, who's a hip hop reporter at Vibe. And I asked him about, he had tweeted some stuff about, this is before he joined Vibe, but just about like Kodak and not, um, you know, not supporting Kodak, not listening to Kodak because of, I mean, he, he kind of walked it back. He was like, well, actually he just didn't like Kodak in general. Uh, like not, it was, he said part of it was the whole things that Kodak had been accused of, but he just didn't like Kodak in general. I'm like, this is a day, like, you know, it reminds me of when uh, Kendrick, which I really respect, stood up when they try to remove XXS uh, and R. Kelly. And like, I'm not caping for R. Kelly, but they try to remove them from Spotify and they were like, okay, well, I th- it was TDE. And also I think somebody else stood up too. Um, I was like, okay, well, what about 
all these rock stars, right, who were doing these things in the 80s and who, like, there's a list of people who you can say that they've, um, you know, they've sort of, they've, they've had issues, been accused of things, done things. And, I mean, Elvis Presley married, like, a, you know, I mean, whatever. Like, there's just... The, the matter is, is that, like, everyone, even the people that are doing this condemning, like, everyone does shit. Everyone. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's always funny when you see somebody on Twitter will, like, cancel somebody, but then, like, the person who, who canceled the person will then themselves get canceled because people are like, oh, like, look, well, your tweets. Like, it's, mm-hmm. like, just a... You can just keep going. There's actually... Yeah. A, there was this woman... Um, I don't remember her name, but she... You know, Charles, she, Charles Brockley was talking to her off the record, and, um, like, he made a joke. He, he said something like, if you weren't a woman, I would throw you out the window. You know, just a, a joke. And, you know, first of all, like, off the record, like, reporters are supposed to take that very seriously. Like, if someone says, hey, this is off the off the record, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's not supposed to be, uh, you know, you're not supposed to really report it. But she goes on Twitter and she says, oh, like, Charles Barkley, um, you know, whatever. And this reporter, um, I can't, I'm trying to find her name. Oh, Alexi McCammon. She's a political reporter for Axios, and you know she had said this is in November 2019. I guess this is like around. It's funny. I feel like cancel culture kind of everyone's kind of debating like cancel culture this and that like 2019, 2020. And it feels like we've all kind of quietly agreed that it does exist, and just kind of not like the people who were kind of being called like, oh, like you're wrong for thinking this is a thing. No one ever really, you know. I think we just everyone kind of moved on. It's like okay, this, this is kind of like this was kind of a thing. Like we did kind of overreact. But yeah, she, you know, she had a tweet. You know, oh, he's so Barkley said, I don't hit women, but if I did, I would hit you. Like, you know, off, like it was some some sort of, you know, thing. And then he said she couldn't take a joke. And she kind of tweeted this. And, you know, you know how the internet is, people kind of dogpile. But then later she got promoted to like be the head of Teen Vogue or something. And then people dug up her old tweets of her kind of saying things about Asians. And I think maybe, you know, some other category of people. Um, but it's just like we can't keep condemning each other because it's just, it's like, it's that whole he without sin cast the first stone thing where it's like, where does it end? No one ha- no one is with that. It's just, <clears throat> it's honestly, you know, I watch it happen. It's like people are just like really just trying to make themselves feel better. I talk about it a lot when I talk about Kanye. I feel like when I see like guys, especially black guys, being so excited. There's this guy that I know who he knows I love Kanye. So like every time something happens with Kanye, he like messages me and like, look at this, like here, what are you going to say now? And I even thought it was funny with the whole Black Lives Matter thing. Like, I'm like, I literally tweeted, I'm like, bitch, don't count on my unhappiness. That shit don't make, shit don't make me mad. So don't ever think that something is making me mad, but whatever. But like, it's just interesting because I just feel like it's really just a chance for people to be like, I'm better than him. See? Look, you thought he was so cool. You thought he was this, da 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 da. But like, I would never do that. And this is crazy. Like, I just think it's just a chance for people to feel like, you know, I'm better than this person. I'm better than this influencer that I follow because she one day tweeted this, and I don't think like this. So, wow, how could you ever? And then it's like now we have this whole thing where people are literally famous from calling people out. Like, there's people on Twitter who that's all they do is yeah, like TikTok. I think TikTok is big for that too, where it's like calling people out. Yeah, yeah I mean, so it's, it's, now it's it's all an attention grab. Yeah, it's strange. I think it has corrected a little. I feel like 2019, 2020, we were deep in sort of the quote unquote cancel culture. I feel like it's correct. I remember I saw a tweet recently. They were, they announced uh, Rush Hour Four, and somebody was like, "Yo, it better not be that Gen Z shit. Like, give me that real cancelable." And it had like crazy retweets. And I'm like, "Oh wait, so we're we're acknowledging that cancel culture does exist. That people do kind of OD and go like overreact." And I remember like it's it's it would it was kind of like people would. Like someone would, uh, I remember that that Shane Gillis, um, he got hired for SNL, this comedian, and people went into his kind of because he was kind of more right, oh, a little bit right wing or just conservative, and I think SNL was trying to switch it up a little bit because they basically are just a Democrat like you know establishment whatever, and mm-hmm. so people dug into his tweets and his old jokes and stuff and got he got he lost the job and there's this thing that's very perverse I feel like about a, a moment of someone's like high right a moment that's, of someone's joy and going and seeking it's like let me let me archive their you know let me go back however many years it takes to find something damaging mm-hmm. to take that no, away from them like it feels it's crazy as fuck and it's wild i definitely feel like i saw in 2020 so many people that's happened to like um the girl b simone like i've never personally followed her like whatever but 
I literally watched them build this girl up. I think she was doing like some kind of like manifestation challenge or she was trying to make like a certain amount of money every day or whatever. And I watched them like be like, oh my God, this is so crazy. We love her. Everyone's following her. Everyone's supporting her. And then as soon as she got really big and I think she made her goal or something, then people start coming out. Oh, she copied this book from this and da 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 da. And it's just like, bro. Y'all literally just want to put somebody... In. It's very, very weird. And it's yeah. like... I, I think people also just get feel empowered, right? Like, being outraged... And you talk about that a little bit even on Twitter. Like, outrage is not like... like people find almost... It's almost like people are happiest when they're upset about something. I mean, I'm saying people broadly, but I mean, like, a certain type of person where it's like, there's a certain think- joy in the witch hunt. In, 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 like, it's almost... It's a bonding mechanism of, like, we're all going to hate this person now. We're all going to hate Kanye. We're all going to hate, yeah. you know... I think that that really came. I feel like that is one of the, like, things that we have to thank, like, COVID for. Because I feel like one of the biggest things about, like, the COVID pandemic issue is the fact of, like, what you were just talking about. Like, the beaches and stuff. Like, happiness was really not allowed. Like, it was no longer cool to just be happy. If you was too happy... They was going to find a reason for you to not be so happy no more. So it's like, they literally, like, I I think that now it's to the point where it's like, people don't, like, they find, like, it's it's cooler to post sad things and it's cooler to be, like, sad, so. That's true. I'm trying to remember, what's the name of a QCP's, like, baby mama? The one, she had a really funny tweet that kind of was like, people were like, yo, they're like, how can you say this right now? There are people dying and people are like, yeah, I know that people dying, but like, I'm still thick. <laughs> like, you know what I mean, like, yeah. that. um, basically, yeah, but it is this idea. I mean, yeah, I do remember that now that you say that about COVID where it was like, um, basically like, Hey, like, what are you doing expressing joy publicly? Like, don't you know that people are dying basically? Yeah. So I feel like from that, it's just kind of like been this thing where like depression is just so normalized and like, being sad and I just feel like it's just not you're just not supposed to post because I remember even like before COVID and that's why I really didn't go for the bullshit because I see this as like a pattern I feel like this is like I don't really know I'm not a super like fall down the rabbit hole conspiracist but I do feel like the media likes to make us scared and like you know controls us in that way and I feel like They've been doing it before COVID. I remember seeing things like, oh, all these black girls are getting kidnapped. So now every black girl, you should be afraid when you leave your house because they're going to kidnap you. There's just always been these things that's like we're supposed to like, you know, and then even like when they um, when someone when a police officer kills like a black boy, then it's like, oh, you're not supposed to post on this day. Now only people post about this. And I remember even I got canceled one time because I literally dropped my collection like during the riots and um yeah oh i didn't know that i mean so i, I found one too by the way so kaylar will said in more important news i'm thick as fuck this is this is june 18 2018 and somebody responded bro people are dying and being kept in cages at the border and i think she replied yeah I'm, like i'm sorry like basically sorry about that but i'm still thick as fuck. like and it, i think it, even you're right. i think now that i look at that tweet it really went back to the trump days of like every day is like a hysterical thing it's like you like we have to focus on and the whole kids in cages thing I mean, that was one of my times when I kind of became just more apolitical or just less kind of partisan. So I remember being like, oh, wow, kids are in cages. That's really bad. And then like a co- what, what would happen is a co- on Twitter is that a couple like really big Democrats would tweet like, look at these pictures. Like, how can you not see these pictures and be upset? And then it'll turn out the pictures were from 2014 or 2015 because there were kids in cages. At the, like there were kids in cages, you know, under Obama, too. And then they'll just delete it. So it's like, oh, you don't really care about kids in cages. It's just a political thing. It's just like, oh, like, you know, like. They're like, if you think kids in cages are bad, then you wouldn't be like, and if you think it's just bad, period, right? Like, they report shit to us every day, like we fucking Superman or something. The fuck am I supposed to do? And well, that's also- what I really tried to tell a lot of people during that time. Like, I'm like, bro, I get it that you guys feel for these things that are going on, but you're trying to pay your rent next month. Like, that's actually your struggle. Yeah. <laughs> and it's and okay. also, yeah. And like, to be like, I want to, for, cause somebody who's like a super Democrat is going to hear this and be like, oh, well, it's different. Cause basically, Obama, the kids in cages were the, like kids who came unaccompanied. And I guess Trump would separate, like, a parent, I guess like when Trump, like groups came, he would separate the adults and the kids. And, you know, but the people weren't like, oh, the separation is bad. They were like, kids in cages are bad. 
So then when they would post these pictures, and it would turn out, oh, actually, uh, this is from 2015 under Obama, and they would delete it. It's like, oh, wait, so you don't actually care. Like, it's just a, it's just a way to It's gain. not that no cares about kids being in cages. It's just about the fact that, like, the way that people, like, post these things. And that's another thing, too. Like, I'm really, I really don't fuck with the whole oh, you don't post about negative things so you're not a good person and you don't care what's going on. Like, nigga, I care. Like, it's sad. Of course it's sad. If I had the power to control it, I wouldn't allow it to happen. But I don't have the power to control it. You don't, think, have- you don't think your black square is going to, posting a black square is going to gonna end, going to change exactly. everything? Yeah. Um, no, yeah. Oh, and I feel like we're going to lose people because we're, we're both, we're, I, don't, I don't even say we're cynical. I think we're just kind of realistic. Like, I just don't. I don't know. I think that things got very... I, I get it. People were, like, freaked out under Trump, and people were freaked out under COVID. You and- know, honestly, I don't think we're losing anyone. You know, I feel like lately, I have these thoughts, and I just feel like, oh, the world is just so dumb. Like, everyone just believes everything so easily. But I actually feel like things are turning around. A lot of the things that I... I get less hate for the things that I have to say, and I feel like a lot more people are starting to look at things and be like, wait, nah, this isn't, or like, it just used to be this super, like you were saying that it used to be this super politically correct way to do things. And I feel like now people are realizing that that shit doesn't really, it's not real. You're right. I I think you're right. Actually, you're right. I think the pendulum is swinging back. I also think people realize like, cause it's like, oh, like elect Biden, he's going to, everything's going to be better. It's like, wait, actually a lot of things are the same or like worse. Right. I think people like say what you will, but everybody was having money and working under, under, you know, and I'm not saying Trump is, is because of Trump, but like prices went crazy and I, look a lot of things were because of outside effects but the funny thing is like that's the point right like whoever the president is there's just certain things that are outside of that like of, of their of their control it reminds me of like um <laughs> this is gonna i feel like i'm not gonna get canceled but whatever i think that people it's funny like people will be like like gas prices are really high people are like well biden doesn't control gas prices like the president actually can only do so much and it's like yeah but when trump was president like every time somebody died of covid it was like see like it was, y'all may see like Trump like injected them with COVID like each individual person and now everyone's like has nuance like well actually the president can only do so much and the gas price is not really his fault and it's really a much deeper it's because of supply chain and this and that it's like yeah but that's that was true four years ago like there's so many things that you know yeah. are exist beyond who is the president right and I think people just get so caught up in you know and and all that type of stuff but I do think it's changing I do think you, you get you get I mean. Elon needs to give you back your original Twitter, but you do get less, less. Wait, what was the tweet that got you like banned? Was it like, was it a COVID thing? What's funny is that I, nah, I was actually banned, I think, because supposedly I'm fat phobic. I think that you, yeah, I think people were asked, were, were mad about your, your clothes sizes. Yeah, that was a really big thing. But I think that what the problem was is that I, I don't even know. Yo, it was such a crazy thing. And I honestly would love if we could all revisit that, because I feel that now people would really look at it and be like, this was so dumb. And we really attacked this girl for no reason. I think people really be like, I don't know, but Twitter, Twitter is a very funny, has an interesting way of showing like where people are. And I think that especially in 2020 and 2021, people were just like in a very weird place. Also, I kind of feel like Twitter is like mostly bots too, but like, yeah, that's what Elon thought. I mean, it's definitely a lot of that. I mean, it's weird. People, people, there's, I mean, it's like the witch hunt, right? Like people, and there's a bonding mechanism of surrounding someone and dis- and trying to destroy them. If it makes you, because imagine if you have no power, you hate, you hate your life, you hate your job, but today but you can, you can put down Kanye. Yeah. You get to bond, band together and put, and I look, I'm like, I'm not to say that, oh, there's no cause to ever kind of hold somebody accountable, but even like that language makes me kind of like, Cause it's like who, like who, who are you to hold somebody accountable? Like, and also, people say they hate, you know, f the police and defund the police. Like, I think also too, because, like, for example, I haven't canceled anyone except R. Kelly, okay. <laughs> and I honestly do just feel, and I mean, maybe it's just because you know I actually watched um, the whole, like, I watched like the first like little documentary that they did and stuff, and to me the shit is just crazy. Like I'm just like, whoa! Like you got girls begging to use the bathroom and shit. Like this is outlandish. It is. But when you say cancel, did you like stop listening to the music or what? Like, yeah, what? I don't want to start okay. anymore, which is very hard. I will admit, it's hard to do. The nigga got songs, 
Like, okay, Bree, let's talk. It's, okay, it's so funny that you say this. I feel like people, do, I feel like R. Kelly is the one person people don't do this with, but people do this thing when they cancel people. They're like, they weren't even that good anyway. Like, they weren't even that nice anyway. Oh, you know, yeah. Like, they'll be like, oh, like, like Jake. Like, and I will say this. I'm not canceling the songs that he wrote. Like, if he wrote Aaliyah's song, I'm playing it. I don't care. But, like, you know, just I can't really listen to his music in the same way now knowing that, like, this is, like, what he was doing at the same time. Yeah. So I'm not saying that things, you shouldn't stand for things. But I feel like people ha- are just so, it's just so much that now real shit can't even be looked at in a certain way because y'all cancel everyone for every little thing that it's just like, you're just mad all the time. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do agree. The good thing is that it does feel like it's shifting a little bit. Like, even like you're saying, you get less pushback on certain things, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think that, yeah, people do it with, with JK Rowling sometimes on Twitter and like Twitter is just the worst. Cause it's, it's not r- really, it's an echo chamber. Oh, yeah. It's not, you know, but they're like, Oh, like Harry Potter wasn't even that good. Cause you know, she's, she, she's been accused of being transphobic now. And people are like, oh, Harry Potter wasn't even. I'm like, yo, Harry Potter was nice. Like, I loved Harry Potter. Like, I used to stand in line. I used to read all the books. I read them. I read it in a, in a day. Like, Harry Potter was great. And I think people can't. I think that that it goes to the issue that people can't hold the two ideas in their head. That like, a terrible person can make a great. Like, terrible people can do really good things. Terrible, and, and no one's like terrible well, people can make terrible. great art. Like, yeah, what it, someone terrible? Exactly. Allegedly, like pe- people that you believe are terrible are capable of also doing really fire, like making really amazing art. Um, and so, yeah, you no, know, disagreeing with people is like perfectly fine. And like, I disagree with damn near everyone. Like, even you started this by saying we don't agree on everything. Like, and it's really okay. Like, I think that people, uh, this idea that everyone needs to think the same or everyone is going to think the same is really like just crazy. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's I mean not to cut you off, but people always say this thing like, "Oh, read the room," you know, where it's like, "Oh, you know, like don't." And it's like, that's like great advice for career advancement. That's great advice for kind of corporate culture. But for like just living in the, like, that's like you're saying, oh, whatever the majority believes kind of acquiesce to that. And it's like, if you went back in time, you're like, like you would tell, would you tell like a, a an abolitionist in the South, hey, read the room, read the room. Like this <laughs> no, slavery shit. Like to read the room? Yeah. You'd be like, oh, like, hey, this, this slavery thing is what everyone's doing right now. You over here trying to end it. Like, bro, read the room, bro. We, we're all on this slavery tip. Like, why are you trying to end slavery, bro? Like, this is can't you read the room? Like the majority is often wrong. Right. And I think the idea of like, it, it, every time I, and I, like it makes sense in certain things where it's like, if you're working in a corporate culture, you don't want to rock the boat, but it's like the world is in a corporate culture. Right. And like morality isn't a majority because the majority can be wrong all the time. Um, and I think, yeah, I, don't know, I just thought it was very bold. Cause like there's certain things that like, I, I I'm afraid of being canceled or something. Cause it's, the, the boat kind of already passed on that a little bit, but I think that, there's certain things like I won't say I I, I, I definitely self censor to some extent. And I mean, I try not to on this podcast, but I think that um, like to see you be, be so, and like to get, cause you were getting attacked on Twitter a lot. Like it, during the, the height of COVID when you're like, yo, like this stuff is not, you know, like this is when you talk about depression. And I was like, wow, like you're so bold to kind of speak your mind, especially to be somebody who works in entertainment where, I mean, if you step out of line, I mean, you know, you, I mean, it's a different because you have your own brand. So you're not, it's not like you're working for, a, you know, Disney or Fox where they can be like, all right, boom, we're, we don't want to associate with her. But it still can block opportunities, right? It can still yeah, be very I mean, costly. It's my brand. So then everyone can be like, we don't like her, so we're not going to shop with her. Yeah. But I think, like, my whole thing through the process is, like, and I, I always, like, truly thank God that I even experienced that because I am – like, I really believe in manifestation. So, like, I don't believe that the outward environment is what creates, like, what happens, like, in my life. Like, you know, I think it's what I think and how I feel about things. And, like, I remember everybody being so mad because I was going to drop my collection um, during the... The Floyd? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the George Floyd situation. <laughs> Everyone's mad that I was going to drop my clothes during that because it was like everyone was outside protesting and et cetera. And I literally got like, that was another day whenever I was being like attacked on Twitter and then my collection sold out. And I just felt like, I just feel like that's something that a lot of people don't have the like privilege of seeing happen for themselves. And to like, understand, like, you know, a lot of times I've had to tell myself, 
my business and the things that I do is not like it. Although, like, you know, it seems as if I need the Internet perception to like me in order to do this. Like, it's really about the fact that I've made connections with manufacturers and I've trained myself to design clothes and I've done like, you know, like it's like real work. And yeah, you've like gone to China, like you've literally been to China, right? Like to actually like go to I mean. Yeah, that's amazing. Congrats on, on selling out. I mean, I think that, um, like, selling out, literally not selling out uh, in the way we say people sell out. Um, Yeah, that's, I mean, but how do you deal with that mentally? Like, being attacked online, I think on the one hand, like, it can be like, okay, just log off. But it can also take a toll on you, like, mentally. I think, too, another thing is that, like, uh, all the things that I said online, or anything that I that I say online, is something that I truly, really believe, like, I don't just be saying shit like I really believe these things. And and, and most times it's something that I've already had like conversations about for like a month or two months prior before I ever like say it online. So a lot of times it's just like things that I really believe. So I don't feel like I should, you know, not talk, not say how I feel and, and really offer my perspective. And I do think that, like, just the way that I interact with people is, like, different because I'm not the kind of person for a long time now. I don't insult people's looks. I don't, like, you know. And so when people start doing stuff like that, then I just already feel like I basically won the argument. And I just feel like, you yeah, know. Yeah, because it's an emotional reaction for sure. Yeah. Also, I mean, you don't really have, have looks that people can insult, I don't think. Um, so you're uh, <laughs> lucky there. Um but okay, so you yeah, that's that's incredible. So you sold out. I do feel like there are things there are th- I like just like you said, like you know, there's things that I wouldn't talk about. There's things that I wouldn't talk about that that are how I feel, and I feel bad about that. Like I literally hate that. Like I hate that there are things that like I talk about with my friends that I wouldn't say online because it's just like why? Like why can I not say how the fuck I feel? And that's one reason why I love Kanye so much because I feel like he really takes a lot of like personal conversations or things that everyone talks about in like closed doors and says it publicly and like starts these other conversations between other people so that they can like rethink and like even redefend. Man. Yeah. It's, it's so crazy that you say that. Cause I remember during the height of the Kanye sort of thing. I, so I play a lot. I play basketball a lot. That's like my, my therapeutic uh, release and like on the weekends. And I remember I, I was playing with these older dudes. Uh, we play like kind of every Sunday. And after the game, you know, after you hoop, we'll like kind of chill and talk. And they were just saying how much they agreed with Kanye. And, and it was because, like, I was like, oh, snap. First of all, it made me think, wow, like, kind of like white liberals, as much as you want to cancel people, like, if you, if, if some, like, random white woman were listening to this conversation, she would try to cancel all these dudes. Like, they were very much, like, basically seeing Kanye lose everything or, you know, lose all these deals made them feel like, see, he's right. I'm not mm-hmm. saying that he's right, but it just made me be like, these are the conversations that people are having, right? Like whether it's at the barbershop, at the gym. And it made me realize that also just that the the way that kind of canceling somebody, especially for that specific thing, can kind of backfire. Cause I'm like, oh wow, like this is what's happening. Like now everyone's just being like, yo, like, hey, maybe does he have a point? You know, I didn't think what's happened with some people. I feel like people also look at the LGBTQ um community differently as well, just for the amount of time that they have canceled people. Like, I mean, basically. Uh, the baby or what? No, not the baby. The baby, but who did the comedian? Uh, Dave Chappelle. Oh, uh, oh, oh, yeah. How did I not think about? It? I mean, oh, like yeah. Although I say about that. Yeah, although I do think somebody's gonna listen and say, "Well, he just hosted SNL, so he's not canceled." But like, also, okay, the other thing that the other th- no, but I'm, t- I'm saying what he's talked about. Like, he's basically brought that to life. He talked t- brought that to light. He talked about the baby in his stand up, like basically saying like. Y'all are canceling, pe- y'all are canceling black men. Like y'all are ruining their lives. Like it's just like it's kind of like a weird thing that's happening where it's just like we're not seeing the bigger picture and we're just. Well, th- there's also this weird thing where it's like, and I think the Brittany Griner thing is gonna kind of is also a moment where it's like it's difficult to say. And I'm not saying look, LGBTQ people, people are ma- marginalized in lots of ways, um, but it's like it's hard to say you're marginalized when you have the power to kind of you know it's, it's, it becomes. At some point, it's like, okay, well, if you can, if if speaking badly about you can cost someone billions, mm-hmm. then in what way are, way are you marginalized? Like, in what way are you powerless? Or in what way are you oppressed? Right? Yeah, or, like it's one of those things where, um, 
we like are losing like focus on like the actual problems, you know, because people are now using like it to just push their own political ideas. So we're losing like when are when do LGBTQ actually need help? Like, you know, versus when is this uh just bullshit that y'all are like <laughs> Well, it's funny. I had a dude, speaking of like not speaking your mind, I had a guest who, this Liberian actor, well, he's not like a major big actor, but he's like super MAGA and he was like at the Capitol on January 6th. And I remember there were certain things that he was saying. I'm like, oh crap, like this is like, should I put this out? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? But it's like, you know, I think it's important. Like, I think the other thing about censorship is that like, it's important to see ideas that you disagree with, right? Because it strengthens your own, right? Like, if somebody says something I disagree with, then like, I can counter that, right? I can present, like, actually, no, you're wrong. Versus, like, these ideas going underground and just being an echo. I, I, I think that one reason that Trump caught everyone off guard is because people are kind of, like, police those ideas out of the public sphere. So it's like, oh, like, no one likes this person because no one I see likes this person. Well, it's like, yeah, because you've decided that anyone who speaks support of that person, you're going to kind of try to cancel them. So they're not going to say it in front of you. So they're going to kind of say it around their friends. You're not, you're not going to be able to, to confront them. You're not, like, you're robbing yourself of the idea of the ability to confront bad ideas and so then they can just kind of go on the ground and fester or you know ideas that you believe are bad um but yeah you know it's i mean i do think like you said i think we're getting in a moment where it's not like i remember in 2020 it felt like every week somebody was getting like just ran, like not even famous people just like a like random people like a, a dude like a guy who works at a factory like something you know someone gets them fired for some you know some release and like there are specific examples but i don't want to get into them but there, like if you go back and look read look back in 2020 like everyone's kind of going crazy about race about gender about all these things and you know but i think that the, the pendulum has swung back like that, seeing that tweet about uh rush hour everyone's like yo i want that cancelable sh-. <laughs> like don't give me none of this watered down gen z i'm like oh, okay so like people are kind of tired of that um but anyway okay we've been talking about all this other stuff. like your story like how did you go from we're, we're in arkansas little rock Little Rock, Arkansas, yes. Oh yeah, you, I remember you, you saw the. Um, uh, I think you told me this. We want. I won't, I, I guess I'll call it a date. I don't know if it was a date. It was really embarrassing because my car d- declined. The first time it's ever. First of all, it was because it wasn't because it was over the limit. There was like some sort of fr- like it was weird. Like my car declined Wait, when me and you went. We went to out? yeah. We went out once. We went to the was it J Cole concert? We went out twice actually. Actually, each time we went out, there was like a minute. Oh, okay. I don't each remember. Time we went, I, I really don't remember your card declining. So okay, that's <laughs> good. That's good. It's, it's been a while. About, I think about the fact that you Forgot lost. The ticket? <laughs> was looking for this. Okay, so each time we went out twice. This, this is why we never worked out. We went out twice. Oh, this is why? <laughs> well, there are lots of reasons, but we went out twice. The first time, my card declined. And it's like normally it's like okay, you have another card, or like you'll. Like you'll call a bank and they're like, "Oh, it's." But it was like a very. I think like my card had been compromised in some sort of fraud thing, and like I couldn't, because usually you just call and they're like, "Okay, like oh whatever," like you clear it up, or if you're over the limit, you just pay it down or something. But like my card declined, like for whatever reason, maybe I didn't have my debt uh, for some reason. I couldn't pay and like you paid. I think I I don't think cash out you or Venmo to you, but I was like, "Oh crap!" But then the second time we went to this J Cole concert, <laughs> this this guy, um, <laughs> this. This guy, I knew this director who worked with J. Cole. So he left, he left the two tickets. It was like J. Cole and Young Thug. And like, I think you were like a big Thug fan or a big Cole fan. I think Thug. Um, actually, I'm actually a bigger J. Cole fan than I am Thug, but like more so early J. Cole. Right, right. So we but stopped for, we stopped for gas. Or, we stopped at, the, at a gas station for some reason. And I forgot that. <laughs> no, I think, I think I picked up the tickets from the whatever. And then for some reason, I think we had. We had to get. I think I had to get. Oh, I think I want to get water. I think I was like super, super thirsty for some reason. I was like dying of thirst. I had to get something. I think I get water, and I left the tickets like at the like at the, at the thing. I was like, where are? They? I was like looking in my car. It was it was terrible. Um, it was yeah. But um, okay. So tell me about. I, I remember you saw. You said you saw Destiny's Child. Oh, this that's why I brought up J Cole. So or the our, our when we went out, but you saw Destiny's Child in a gymnasium. Yeah, high school. That's one thing I remember in a high school gym. That's a pretty incredible experience. But you grew up yeah. in Little Rock, and then when did you move to Houston? Um, I didn't move into I didn't move to Houston until college. Oh, I always thought because I thought we had so many mutuals. Oh, I thought we had so many mutuals like you know Maxo and like Maxo's manager Toby and like I just assumed you grew up in Houston. 
No, no, I didn't meet. I think I'm trying to, I know Maxo went to TSU with me. I don't think we might have had a class together or something. But I'm like, to, I'm trying to imagine Maxo like going to class at like, at like man, Maxo, he's literally always been the same nigga. It's what's hilarious. He's always been the same person, but you know, he's just a superstar now. Yeah. But yeah. you're a superstar too. You've always been a superstar. That's why Kirko Bangs put you in this music video that you, that you that you don't claim that you that you for whatever reason that did not happen. Okay, so okay, I thought you okay. So you when did you move to Dallas? Yes, yeah, so I moved to Dallas in middle school. So basically, I lived in Arkansas until sixth grade. Were then you always grade. were you always lit? Like because you have you have like a sense of style. You have like a very like you have like three hundred some thousand followers on Instagram. You have like an aesthetic. Like you blew up on Tumblr. Like, were you always kind of an it girl? Uh, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you thought about, like, um, be like try, trying to be humble. Okay, I, I said this thing, which I think might get me. I don't want to say cancel, but I can't tell if it's. Stop, just do it. You're no, no, okay. A- I know. Okay. The thing is, I know. I, I can't tell if it's misogynistic, but I, I'm going to say no because somebody, this, the first person I said it to agreed with me, and she's uh, Zita Morrison. She's like the winner of Love Island season four, uh, US. But I asked her because we were she's a model and we were talking about like if she went through an ugly duckling phase. Like she talked about being awkward and like at some point I was like, oh, I was like, I was like, I I could tell that you went through an ugly duckling phase because I feel like women who are always bad kind of don't like. I feel like basically if you went through an ugly duck, if you could tell if a girl who's bad used to be ugly because she tends to have personality, right? Because I feel like if you if you've always been bad, like you could just always like you really have to develop that part of your you have to really develop personality because it's like people just like you because you're bad. But if you went through an ugly duckling phase, then I feel like you tend to have more personality. So I was hoping that you were going to say, yes, you went through an ugly ducking phase. Because I could be like, oh, yeah, you have a lot of personality. But I guess I'm, you don't. I feel like yeah, nah, Honestly, truly, I mean, I feel like when I look back on like my Facebook pictures, of course, I don't think they look good. But at the time, they looked amazing to everyone. Like, I was that girl. But, I mean, I think that really... I don't know. Like, I think really coming from the South helps my, like, down-to-earthness. I guess I'm extremely down-to-earth. Like, I'm not, I'm, like, I'm in the clouds with, like, the way I want my life to be and stuff. But, like, when it comes to, like, me dealing with people, I just feel like I'm just, like, the same to everyone. I don't, yeah. like, did you always Did you always want to do fashion? Because I feel like fashion is one of those industries. I mean, creative things in general, you tend to, you need to have, like, a rich rich parents or you know so and like that's why i love that like you literally just came from you know little rock arkansas and decided that your life was going to be what it is and now you know you're you've i mean your your clothes have been worn by kim kardashian by drea um by um tiana taylor uh, yeah. um you know tons no, of other I, people i really didn't think about it and i think like me not thinking about it really helped because i've always said like i know people that come to me and like they want like I don't know I just feel like it was really something that I fell into and so I just never over I would I didn't overthink it when I moved to New York so basically I moved to Dallas from Little Rock in sixth grade and then I moved from Dallas to Houston did you you graduate did you finish at TSU no I didn't I dropped out three and a half years and I just had a semester left And um, I left because I literally was like, I never want to like hand a resume to anyone or like show my diploma to anyone anyway. And so I just was like, yeah, this is done. That's so bold. (laughs) That's so dope. Yeah. Like at that point, I was really just like, um, I was just really into, I I just believed in myself so much. I had just recently read this book, like The Secret. And so I just really took that shit to heart. Like the first time I read The Secret, like it really changed my life. Like, and I started reading like a lot of books like that. And so like, I just was like on this high and I really haven't come down truly, but like, I just was really, I don't have to do this stuff. Like, you know, whatever I want to put my mind to, I'm going to do it. And at the time I wanted to be a model. And so I was like, all right, cool. Like I started going to New York. 
like literally just in like the six months after I read. Wait, this. was this was this sorry was this before or after? Because I remember you blew up on TikTok. Like you kind of I know t- t- Tumblr. Like you had a Tumblr sort of follow. Like I don't know. Yeah, I had, was this before I had or after? My Tumblr, Tumblr following like through my Houston days, like while I was in college. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that was like that time. So like. So I you, had, like, you had some sort of validation that like, all right, I look good. Like, you know, I can, I can do this. Yeah. So I was like, okay, like I want to model, like, and I want to take it seriously. And I felt like nobody in Houston was like really taking it seriously. So I was like, all right, bet I'm going to go to New York. And I just like literally dropped out of college, sold my little Jeep that I had that wasn't working <laughs> and went to New York. I think I had like $2,000. That's from Twin Peaks? No, from selling my Jeep. Oh, from... What what happened to the Twin Peaks money? That was just your rent money. I, I no, I got I Twin Peaks fired me like six months before I left Houston. So like I didn't have a job for like the last semester. So like that first semester of my senior year when I was supposed to graduate, I had just lost my job, um, like that summer before, and like the week I lost my job, I had this Jeep, the Jeep just stopped working. So then I didn't have a car or a job. Uh, so and Houston, like, you have to get have a car. I mean, you have Houston to have a like, car and you have to have a job or what the <laughs> fuck are you doing? Like you literally like, it's crazy. So like, that's really why like, I started going to New York. And at the time I had like a little following. I had like, I think like probably already a hundred thousand followers on Instagram too. And I had like my Tumblr following and, um, I was like going out there, like doing like little modeling jobs where people was paying me like maybe like a hundred or like two hundred dollars or like three hundred dollars or whatever. But I was like, well, shit, I'm not making no money in Houston. So then by that Christmas, I literally just sold my Jeep and just moved to New York. Oh my, this is this is full circle. I definitely emailed you when you were living in New York because I, I saw it like you. We never linked. I saw. I just like saw you on. I think I saw you on Instagram. I was like, what? I feel like you always had like an aesthetic where it was like, oh, like. I don't know, something, I think, because even you going viral on Tumblr, or, like, get, getting a big Tumblr following, and getting a big Instagram following, I feel like your look, I guess back then, people, we hadn't entered into, like, the Kardashian face uh, BBL, because I feel like LA is very much, like, everyone has, not everyone, but a lot of people in that industry have, like, the Kardashian face and, like, the BBL now, mm-hmm. but, like, you have, like, you never, I don't know, you're, like, obviously, like, like slim, which I guess why you get called fat phobic, one of the reasons. Um, but or you know, as far as your brand or whatever they sizes they carry, but like you always definitely had like I guess a look that people just gravitated towards. Like, what was that like? Like, like what what was you like? Were you like did it go to your head or were you just like oh, okay, like this is something like unique? No, like I don't think I I don't think it's ever really gone to my head. I feel like for some reason I've always just like I don't know. Like I I thought it was cool and I like taking pictures and I love like posting like I think it's fun I love especially like around that time like I love Tumblr I think like Tumblr has influenced me like a lot and I talk about it like just like the idea of like an aesthetic and like creating like aesthetics I think like really comes from like that for me it comes from like the amount of time I spent on Tumblr and I've always loved social media. Even before Tumblr, I loved Facebook. I loved MySpace. I love like all of that shit. Like I'm really like low key a social media kid, but like in like a different way, I guess than like the ones now. Yeah. But like, yeah, I don't know. I think like, I mean, I, I think I'm even just now like coming to like really appreciate myself and be like, oh yeah, like. I look amazing and I look good and like, you know, whatever. Okay. There's no way you're just now appreciating that. Cause I feel like you post, like you're very, I'm not gonna say provocative, but you don't, you're, you post. I remember one time you were like talking about, I said in 2020 when everyone was starting OnlyFans, you're like, well, my posts that I post on my Instagram are basically like what somebody would post on their OnlyFans down there. Like not all the way. Well, not, not nowadays. Cause nowadays people go crazy. <laughs> nowadays OnlyFans is a little bit crazier, but I feel like you've always. That, like, you know, I think I said something like it, like, I think, I don't know, like, I post things that some people post on OnlyFans, I guess, sometimes, but, like, if I was to charge for it, like, it would just, it couldn't be, like, OnlyFans prices. It's just art, you know? It's just, like, the things that I like to post. And I think I used to post much differently, I guess, when I was younger, too. But I think, like, again, for me, it's always just been, like, a cool, like, aesthetic thing. Like, I want to take, I want to take good pictures. I want to take cute pictures. I love taking cute pictures. I'm going to be taking cute pictures for the rest of my life. 
Like, no, it's good. Taking cute pictures has got you very far. Um, okay, so you're 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 modeling in New York. When did you? Is that when you start Matt Brand? Like, were you just like, hey, like people want me to model for their brands? Why don't I just start my own? Yeah, that is where I started, Matt. And um, it did kind of come from that. Like, there was even this girl that I was modeling for in Houston. And, like, me and her were, like, becoming friends. And she was like, yeah, like, selling clothes is just like selling weed. And she was just basically saying, like, you know, you just buy it low and you sell it high. And, like, you know, you flip your money. (laughs) Well, I guess in that case, buying anything is like, selling anything is like selling weed. Because you, yeah, you buy low and sell high. You put it down for me in that way. And I'm just like, oh, damn. Like, you know, this makes a lot of sense. And even um, my boyfriend f- that, like, we started dating whenever I was in New York at the time, my boyfriend at the time. And he had a brand. And so I remember one day I literally watched him make, like, he, like, got this shirt from this, like, military surplus store by this bus stop that we used to catch. And he literally bought the shirt. And like put his logo on it, and I watched him make like a thousand, two thousand dollars off of it in like a week. And he didn't even have like a following like me, so like I was like, oh, I could do this. Like you know, I could definitely buy something, you know, brand it in a way, and like sell it. Mm, wow, now you're making me want to uh, start sell clothes. Wait, so was he? So y'all were taking the bus. This is normally takes the y'all are in the tr- were y'all in the trenches. He like in Jersey. he lived in he lived in Jersey. We uh, okay, I thought you. Okay, I thought this was in LA. I'm like nobody takes the bus in LA. Uh, all no. right, so you were in Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how? Okay, so you met. So he kind of helped get you into it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And also, I feel like so when did it, when did it start really taking off? Because like I mean, to go from that to Kim Kardashian is wearing it, Dre is wearing it. Um, In one year, uh, Kim Kardashian wore the bodysuit that I had, but a lot happened in that year. So like basically, I started it in like August. Um, I don't remember the exact year right now, but <laughs> the August that I lived in New York. And then I broke my leg in January and I ended up moving to LA in like March, like of that next year. And then I, like, so my business changed so much just from like being in New York and going to LA. When I was in New York, I was like building it. I was like working with girls that knew how to sew. Like I'll ask them, hey, like, let's go to the fabric store. We'll find fabric. I'm like, can you make a dress out of this? They make me, like, five dresses, and then I sell it on the website, you know? Oh, wow. We even started, I even started working with, like, two girls. Like, we were selling a lot, and I would basically give them, like, 60% of the sales, and I would take 40%. But all I would do is, like, promote and market it. And then they would, like, sew it and ship it. And I would kind of, like, manage the orders and stuff. I also was, like, making, like, hand-making jewelry. I made, like, quite a bit of money off of hand-making jewelry. Um, so I was doing all of that, like, in New York. And that's, like, basically how I started, Matt. And then whenever I moved to L.A., March 20 or what, March whatever year that was, was the first, that was the first time I had made, like, $10,000 in a month. And so I was, like, basically doing pretty well. I think that that first year that I lived in LA, I made a hundred thousand that year. And that was basically like my first year of Matt other you know, wow. a few months in New York. So um also you you lived like the New York I remember you, I think you told me once that you were living in an apartment with, it was like a studio basically but it was like two of y'all and like it was just like a divider. Like something like one of those situations where it's like because I feel like people never really appreciate the come up. People always see like the glow, they see the after and they think, man, who, where, where, where did this person come from? But then- New York was where I struggled. Like in LA, everything was amazing. But in New York City, nigga, when I first moved out there, I lived in Far Rockaway. People oh, wow. from New York know where that is. It's like in Queens. It's literally the last stop on the A train is the stop that I like stayed at. And so it used to take us like two hours to get to the city on the train. Like I remember one night just crying because I kept getting off. The, it was just such, it was so much. You got off on the wrong stop? Like the, the A train splits at the end. So you have to, when you stay on the last stop, you have to pay attention to which train you're catching. It's <laughs> funny. That's funny. It was just so annoying. So I was having a hard time figuring that out. Like the first week I moved out there and I was like on the train for like three hours and I was just so pissed. Oh, wow. But and you lived. Um, you lived in like a. Was it like a studio or it was like? Cause I remember you said it was like a couple people or something. It was like I a, moved like six times in one year. Oh my goodness! Why yeah. was it just like? Because I kept like so I lived where I just told you that was like on the last stop. I only stayed there for like a month 
then I was like, no, nah, I got to go. Like, this shit is too far. I found another um, room in, like, this, like, townhouse thing, I guess. I was basically staying in, like, the basement, though. It was just two floors, but it was, like, whatever. It was a lot of people. It was, like, six people living there. Yeah. And they had like had it all divided up in this way. That was like so bad. I always talk about how I literally used to warm myself up with a blow dryer because See, it was so cold. I'm so like fascinated. I think that like I talk to creators and like when I went to school, I always had this idea that like for you have to kind of have a huge stack of bread to really but like before I could ever I think I just didn't believe in myself enough maybe to like just go on a creative path or just to go off the beaten path. Like Harvard's very much like finance consulting, like corporate. And I talked to people, like I remember I knew this guy and now he has a show called uh, Flatbush Misdemeanors, Kevin Iso. I remember he said that he, he moved to New York on some just sort of like, I, like similar to you almost like I want to, like I need to be here. I want to do comedy. And he, I remember him saying that like he read about, I think Hannibal Burris was homeless sleeping on the subway. So he's like, yo, if I, I can come out there, like I could do that basically. I'm like, I'm like the way I think I'm like, yeah, but think of all the people who are homeless sleep on the subway who didn't become superstars, right? Like, why do you why are you so sure that you're gonna be the one? It's who's crazy. Gonna... I didn't realize that until I moved to New York. Like when I was in Houston, in my mind, New York was this place where stars lived and amazing things happened. And oh my God, and I even visited like twice. And I still saw it that way. Like I seen people staying and having like six roommates, and I thought that shit was cute and cool when I was just visiting. And then when I lived there, that's when I really realized I'm like, yo. 99% of the people that live here are fucking struggling. Like, yeah. it's hard. I mean, it's, I, I think that, like, I'm fascinated by people. And I think that, because I've, I've always, like, I think I have a very analytical sort of math science brain. And so when people start talking about manifesting and energy and this stuff, I'm like, you know, here we go. But as I get a little bit older, I, I, I like, I subscribe, I don't subscribe to it fully, but I increasingly kind of understand. And even, like, if it works for you, it works for you, right? I think, because I've just never been the person who's like, okay, like, who has that level of audacity where it's like, okay, like I'm, yeah, I'm going to move to the city with $2,000 and it's just going to happen for me, you know? And like, and like, I wish I had that attitude, but I've never really had that sort of attitude where it's like, oh yeah, like this is just like, I'm manifesting it. Like this is what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think for me it's spiritual, but also I've read so many books that I honestly feel like I could convince the most like scientific person because truly it is like science what's happening. But like at the same time, at the end of the day, like the way that you think about it is not wrong. Like, yes, it is smart to move to New York with $100,000 instead of moving there with $2,000. You are going to be struggling if you move to New York with $2,000 and you would struggle a lot less if you move to New York with $100,000. Like, yes. But I just think that like, you know, I and... I think the thing is, is that people feel like, I guess like for me, like why it was okay for me to move there with that amount of money is because I did believe, like I was like, nah, like, and I used to be even crazier than I am now. Like the way that like I thought about it, like I remember I had this hashtag, I'm gonna have six figures in four months, all this shit. Like I just was like, really like, no, like I'm, I'm going to be rich. Just yeah, from and not even like and it wasn't even like I thought I was gonna be famous. When I moved there, my first idea was an app. And it's so funny because the app, low key, if I was to break down what the idea was, it's really only fans. Like I was basically had the idea to like create like exclusive content with girls that had a lot of followers and sell it to their following for like a dollar. Like wow. Wow. trying to get like Drea to like be the first girl that I used, like, but whatever. I didn't get. How do you look with Drea? I didn't get Drea on the pod. I text her sometimes. We are, we, we we like dry text about like uh, um, because you know acting like writing. I write. She acts. Um, although she's she's funny. She's one of those people who I feel like girls do this thing if they're in a relationship sometimes where they want to make sure you know. So she's like, oh yeah, like actually, okay, I don't, maybe she's not actually. I think she, I think oh, I think I asked her like, oh, if we had Nigerian food before. She's like, oh yeah, my boyfriend. Uh, like we had it together. I'm like, okay. Okay, fine. Like, I get it. Like I'm not, I'm not really trying to holler at you. I just want to, you know, maybe we can work together. Um, but how's you? How so? You, how, you linked up with her in New York? Uh, nah. I don't even know if I knew Drea when I was oh. planning on using her for the thing. You were just like I didn't manifesting Drea until I moved to LA and like I modeled for her brand one day. Right. Okay. So I mean, okay. I think the I, I, the way I've where I've come to land on the whole manifesting and energy thing 
is that I think there are people who take it way too far where they're like, oh, if you just think about money, you'll make, you know, if you think about money, you'll attract money and you'll find a hundred dollars on the floor. I'm like, okay, that, that, that's kind of, you know, but I think that if you like, if you're more, if you, if you're more positive, if you're walking around with a smile on your face, you'll attract more positivity. If you're walking around like with a stank face, you're going to attract more negativity. Right. And so I think it works in that respect. I think there's people who just take it too far. When your mind is more open that like, in a year I can be a millionaire, then you like attract more ideas that like could lead you there. And then you believe in yourself more to like take those steps. Cause literally I, like I said, I moved to New York with this whole idea. I was going to be rich. I had a hashtag. I was going to have so much money in four months. I didn't have that much money in four months. I was literally struggling. And like, I, so many times my mom was like, come back to Texas. Like, you know, and I just kept with this belief, like, no, like I'm here for a reason and something is going to happen. And eight months later I started math. So okay. like it didn't take long. And then a year from that, I was making $10,000 in a month. So like, and in a completely different way than I ever thought it would happen. Like I thought, I don't know. I, I mean, I had a, an app idea. I was trying to model, but I never thought that I would make clothes. So. Yeah, no, I mean, and I think also you put in the work. I think they also, they're like in LA, I would encounter people who they feel like I just need to make the vision board and like manifest, but like that's, like, you have to actually do, like you, you know, you got people to sew clothes. You got people to, like, I feel like sometimes people get so caught up in the manifesting and the vision board and stuff where it's like you actually have to do the I things. Think what is, I think when I talk about uh, manifestation, the best, I think what people kind of, miss the mark is that like you have to believe like the more you believe like you have to really believe if you do like a vision board but you don't think that you could get anything on the vision board it doesn't matter like and I guess like that is why people start doing things like that because it does help like you know laying it out and saying confidently this is what I want is kind of a it's starting the belief but like really and truly like you just have to like and that like Whenever you believe something, like if I believe I can close this laptop, I really believe it. I really do it. Like, that's just it. So I think whenever you believe in yourself more than like you, like, aren't you like, yeah, it's cool. I'll move to New York with $2,000 and I'm just going to see what happens because I believe like I can do it. And I think like you start taking like bigger leaps of faith, like, all right, cool. I'm going to start a brand and I'm really going to do this. And like, I'm going to like move to LA now from starting this brand and like I'm going to like find think of a lot of different ways and I'm going to believe that I can do a um design a logo and I'm going to believe that I can design clothes like all of those things like I think a lot of people start thinking oh I can't do that or not like that's so easy for people to tell themselves no that yeah. like I think that's like what really has to be worked on when it comes to like manifesting I think that like the idea of it is like very far from like what's actually happening because we really all manifest our lives like we all are living at the level at which we believe that we can live well i think there's also that quote where it's like the person who thinks he can the person who thinks he can't are both right um how'd you come up with the name matt brand um my boyfriend at the time actually he had he said he wanted to um so his name is kobe (laughs) um but he said i vaguely remember i remember mighty yeah yeah, uh, he said he wanted to put uh, or create like a retail store called Matt, and that it would like carry like a lot of brands, but then like that they're they would also make like some like merch, I guess, for the store, and then he would like just like print Matt on things or whatever. Mm. And he like said that to me like maybe like two or three months before, and like whenever I decided I wanted to start a boutique, I was I had called it a boutique at first. And I was like, oh, can I have that name? No, okay, it's funny. I was just thinking, I was like, I was like, is he gonna like like ask for half? <laughs> He's gonna hear this podcast. I'm like, all right, I need I need half. Um well was it weird because he started first. Was it weird was it weird like your um, I I feel, I'm, I believe Matt Price surpassed whatever he was doing. Was that like tension or no? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think oh, that's it was good. Cool. Like, he, um he really helped me. Like he's he definitely like helped Matt like in the beginning and stuff and it was cool. That's good. So what made you move to LA? Was it the the the, the your knee? Yeah, because I broke my leg and like the doctors are like, we don't know when you're gonna walk. 
and I didn't walk for like six months. So it's just wow. like, well, what happened? Were you in a, a car? Was it a car thing or what happened? That was like a car accident. Oh no! So you you moved to LA. What was that like? Because I remember when I moved to LA, I was I think I moved maybe after you probably, but it was so you know I, I came from the corporate world, so like for me to be around all these people who I had admired or listened to was such a you know it was like a, a, a shock. Um, yeah, when I moved to LA, I really felt like it was like a vacation because I was working for myself. I was already working for myself in um, New York. You know, I had Matt for like maybe like eight months or something. And so then I moved to New York, I moved to LA and it's like just warm weather. Like I'm able to still like work and come up with ideas. Whereas like LA is even like a much better place to be like executing ideas than New York. Um, Especially like the things that I wanted to do, like I Why is still, that? Is it just the, the the people who are there? Yeah, like the fashion district in LA is like huge. Like, and you can literally fucking make whatever you want. And now it's so easy to meet people that can make whatever you want. You know, like you just need to like walk around and ask questions. Wait, uh, you said something before that you 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 think you can convince the most sort of rational minded person uh, about manifesting. I feel like maybe that's probably true but i also feel like part of that could just be because you're like really pretty because i feel like the first time i met somebody from la who was like really into manifesting or like just energy and all that stuff i remember being like wow this is so different this is so unique and i was like wait if like a girl who didn't look like this said this to me i'd be like what are you talking like, about like go away like what are you talking about and i remember being like wow like i'm guilty of sort of letting someone's appearance dictate how i receive the information that they're giving me or is it their confidence I think it was her. I think it was both. I think I realized. I think that like it's funny. I think guys do this thing where they're like, "Oh, like girls have it so easy," but it's like, or like pretty girls have it so easy. But then it's like, well, yeah, but that's because of, like, that's because of us, right? Like that's because often because guys do are just you know. I think but the I people they're like, do you really like girls because they're actually prettier, or do you like girls because they're like they present themselves as prettier? I think it's both, but I think that there's only, like, I think that, like, the world is very cruel to people, to women. Well, people it doesn't find attractive, but especially to women, it doesn't find attractive, right? I think that, it's why I remember sometimes people will give people confidence, like, like to a girl who's, like, considered ugly, like, oh, just be confident. I'm like, no, that's just going to make it worse. Like, I think men, or just people can be very cruel, and they see a woman who's, like, not considered, I mean, you see this a little bit kind of with Lizzo, a little bit, although that's more about, you know, weight than, but I guess weight is a part of attractiveness. Um, at least in you know in, in society, but like you see people being like, like, like where's this confidence? Like, it's like how dare you be confident or how dare you, you see it? Even I think with Coily Ray, right? I think Coily Ray, like people, I think you, I think you might have made this point. But people have made this point of everyone's like all oh, body positivity, body positivity. But then when it's Coily Ray, like yo, you stop shaking that little chicken butt. Like you know what I mean? Like how dare you have the audacity to kind of present yourself in this sort of like basically how dare you you feel confident about your looks? And so I do think that I think part of it is confidence. I think at the same time, Coilere and Lizzo are, have both come very far in life. Where in realistic stand in realistic settings in real life, not online, when they walk into rooms, people don't look at them and talk to them and say things say things oh, about how they look. Oh yeah, no, the internet's. A, I mean, Twitter especially is just like a, not. I mean, it is real life in, a, in certain ways, but it's not real life in other ways. But I do think, I don't know. I think that. I have this friend who created this game called We're Not Really Strangers, and it took over. And I remember, like, I... You you have it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like everyone has it now. And I remember, like, I used to support her. It was a, like, like, I think this is part of me being so rational-minded. Like, I don't... And you talk about therapy culture. Like, that game does remind me. Like, you know, I remember, like, now, like, I'll listen to podcasts, and, like, every ad is about better help and, like, therapy. And it, it, it does feel like we're almost, like, pushing therapy, almost like a drug. But... That's a whole other point. But I think that she used to walk around Soho House in LA, which listeners, Soho House is this members only club. Like, you know, it tends to be creatives and stuff, especially in LA. Uh, there's one in LA, New York, you know, Austin has one now. Well, none in Houston yet, because Houston's kind of not, you know, super popping. But um, she would walk around Soho House with the game, We're Not Always Strangers. I, I remember she'd be like, yo, like, first of all, how's this a game? Because there's no score. It's just like people, you you ask increasingly kind of personal questions. You know, you pull the cards and you ask these personal questions. And I remember thinking, I almost looked at her as like your homie who's trying to rap, but like you're going to support them even though they can't rap. Like I'll be like, oh, like I'm going to support her. I'm going to go to all her events at Soho House. 
I'm going to support her, but this game is kind of, I don't really get it. Like, I don't, I'm not the type to open up to a complete stranger. And I remember seeing, like, people would, would entertain them in Soho House. I used to think, oh, that's just because she's, like, her and her friend are both, like, really beautiful. Like, they're both, like, she was a model, LA models, and then her friend Iman was, like, just, you know, really beautiful herself. And so I remember thinking, like, oh, the reason people are receiving them in this such positive way, like, if two really beautiful women walk up to me at Soho House, I'm a 40, 50-year-old dude, and they want to start asking me questions, I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to engage with that. Versus if they were, like, look differently, they wouldn't. But obviously the game itself, I was wrong. The game itself is a product that it's in Target now, right? But I, I just do think that, especially in L.A., looks, like, I just remember the first time I ever was encountered someone talking about, like, manifestation energy, I was like, oh, I was, like, really into it. And I was like, wait a second. The only reason I'm into this is because she, I was like, if someone who didn't look like her said this, and maybe this is just me being, um, what's the word, very, like, superficial, but I was like, oh, if this was someone else, I wouldn't. I'm saying, I wonder if you encounter that, too, where you're like, oh, I can convince anybody. But I think that men, to a certain extent, if, like, a really pretty woman is saying something, we're just going to be like, you know, we're just going to be like, just stare and, like, nod. Um, well, I mean, I don't really make a practice of like convincing people of things, but I'm just, I said that to you based off of like the books that I've read and stuff. And like, well, you have to share, I'm going to read, I'm going to read, uh, your reading list. Okay. So you were in LA, like Matt's booming. I remember, you know, there are these articles about you and I want to say like, well, I don't want to misquote which ones, but there are articles about you in several, uh, magazines. Um, and so what was that like? Like, as like it was growing and you're getting received and people are modeling for you. It was cool. Like, you know, when I first moved to LA, I think I was extremely to myself. Me and my boyfriend at the time, we was together for like four years. We spent like the first year together in New York and then the last three years in LA. So like my first three years in LA, I was just like in a relationship. I was just working like, and I feel like, you know, whenever I got out of my relationship, and I started, I guess, to like be on the scene. People had a respect for me by then because, you know, in LA, everything is like, what What do you do? So at that point, Matt was like four years old and it was like, okay, she's cool. She's popping because she has this brand. Oh my, you were on the scene. You had like a Lipstick Alley page dedicated to you. There were people who were like talking about you on like, you were like really on the scene, low key. I forgot about that. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, you know, people have their all sorts of theories. I mean, you don't you don't let that stuff get to you though. Like, I I I hope. Yeah, no, actually, I love it. Truly, I I read all the things about me on Lipstick Alley, and I think it's honestly, it just makes me feel more important. Have you ever read something that was like so untrue? Like, like what? Like how do you, like why do people even think this? I was literally just talking the other day that they were saying on Lipstick Alley and even like, you know, at one point when I was getting canceled, like people were just saying like, oh, she's a coke addict. She's a coke addict. And I'm like, I've never done coke in my life. Like, I don't know. For some reason, like I love like shrooms. I love weed. I don't even mind like Molly. But like for some reason, I just think coke is bad. And I've literally never yeah, tried. I, 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 like, I'm I, the same way. Like, I, I just feel like it's, like, addictive or something, and, like, I just don't want to try it. But it's just crazy. Like, people be saying that I do coke. Like, it's, like, normal, and I'm like... I, I think it's because you're really skinny. But I don't... And also, like, because you're skinny. Still, I feel like a lot of people might be skinny, like, in their early 20s, but then by, like, their late 20s, even if they don't have any kids, they just get, you know, less skinny. And I think maybe that's why. But maybe you just have a high metabolism or do fitness. Maybe weed I smoke. I feel like weed also... Can, oh yeah yeah your appetite i mean i think I, i've never been into drugs at all but yeah i feel the same i'm like yo like coke i think i see coke as like a white drug you know i see yeah, coke as like it's just, it's just i don't even yeah like i've literally never tried it and i don't even have friends that really do it either yeah it is one of those things where you can see something about yourself i mean i've never been necessarily in that uh, actually no i have seen a thing i mean it wasn't an article though where it was silly um but like yeah like being talked about it's just weird it's weird but yeah, you were on the scene. I I've, I have this theory that the reason you don't like Drake is because we were at Drake's uh, whatever birthday party it was where he had the retro like the out the outfits and he posted a picture with him and Chris Brown and you were in the background. Also, you had your blonde hair, which you had before everyone else had blonde hair. By the way, you're, you're a trendsetter. You know, you you do the you do the moves, you make the moves, and then people uh, follow. Um, but I'm like, I feel like you know maybe you just didn't like that. You didn't like him cropping you. Or you you don't like he didn't crop you. You were in the middle. 
But I just don't know. I don't know where the hate comes from, <laughs> where, the, where, the, where, the, where the dislike comes from. I didn't, I didn't like, I would say that I didn't really like Drake probably when I was at this party. But like, though, I don't like, I don't dislike Drake in a personal way, even though I have had an interesting situation with Drake, but it wasn't with me. He was like talking to one of my friends. But like, it was just, it wasn't bad. I have to say it now because people are going to think, he just offered us McDonald's if we wanted to eat McDonald's. And I was just like, Drake. <laughs> but, well, he had McDonald's. I can't remember what party, what which of his birthdays at Poppy, where he, they brought out McDonald's. I only eat McDonald's, but I, don't, I mean, he's very generous in general. I don't like. I think I don't think I that's a reason that he wasn't being generous. And okay, she we actually was with him for the full day. Well, she was in his music video, so it was like we was in doing the video all day, didn't have no food. Which yeah, which video was this? There wasn't no food. It was One Dance. I don't even know if the uh, video ever came out. It never did, yeah. It's one of my... I, I, uh, I mean, I didn't even get him on the podcast. Director X, I'm pretty sure, directed it. And I think it's like a fire... Like, I've seen one other unreleased Drake video, um, but like, there was one, I, I think that one was really fire, and they just never dropped it, which is... And I think the funny thing is, it, it recently became a Diamond single, and it's like the only Diamond single, I think, one of, the, one of the only ones that has, at least rap, maybe, that has no music video. Um, but I, I put that, I mean, well, I, I don't want to talk badly about the director. I'll say I put that on, like, the staff of the music video, less so than I put it Yeah, on but her. then it was like we was, Drake was having a birthday, or not a birthday party, but he was having a party at his house. So he invited us to his house, like, you know, we've been with you all day. We haven't eaten, like, nigga, you going to offer us McDonald's? But anyways, whatever. Okay, I'll say, I, I don't want to be the, the Drake apologist defender. You know, I, I you know, I enjoy his music. Um, you know, I, I like him as a person, but I think that, um, yeah, that's, that's tough. Uh, McDonald, I mean, hmm, I think in general, he's generous, right? Like I think in general, especially with, with people he's involved with, he's pretty generous. That's not why, that's what he, that's what he sells to y'all. But that's yeah. not why I dislike Drake. I just don't, you know, actually I used to really love Drake, um, when he first came out. I love Lil Wayne. So I love Drake when he first came out. Um, I love like probably like the first two or three albums. I just feel like he's just, you know, he's just not as, he not real enough to be one of my favorites. What and what I, makes somebody real? I mean, you like Kendrick. I did like Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, but I feel like part, part of me just also like that because he spoke out against cancel culture. And that's like a small a thing that, I know people are like, oh, you know, it's your whatever. I, not, I shouldn't care so much about what people think, but I was like, okay, that's like, thank you. Like, I appreciate you saying that. Even him having, like, not to like, well, you know, Kodak, whatever, but like him having Kodak on there, it felt like on there like twice, or, like at least twice. Mm-hmm. It he felt did. like, what? I thought Kodak narrated it. Yeah, like he had, Kodak was on there on like a couple, tr- like, yeah, narrated, but also, I mean, he rapped and it's like him. Like, I feel like Kendrick is above, like, he's so above everything. Like, he's not going to, like, like he's he's almost like the old school celebrities who weren't accessible, who weren't, like, you didn't know what they thought, or they, they, they like, they don't comment on things. I mean, and Drake doesn't comment on things like that, but I feel like it reminded me of that sort of old school kind of celebrity. Drake um, just made a song talking about Megan Thee Stallion. It was a, oh my goodness, we're going to, okay, you know what's funny? I would have agreed with you prior, a little bit prior to her loss, because, like, CLB... Like as much as I, I'm a, I love you know his music. CLB just kind of felt a little bit like what people kind of criticize Drake for, which is that like it's almost formulaic. It's like okay, I'm gonna do this many R&B songs, this many rap songs. Mm-hmm. You know, it becomes like a like almost you know I'm, I'm gonna do the song where I'm talking about like my per, you know, like I'm drop I'm messaging my friends and I'm gonna do drop the song about the act. Like it becomes formulaic, and then the house album just house just isn't for me. Um, I understand he's like a global star, so he's trying to do that, but. Her loss, I was like, okay, like he was really rapping. I was like, okay, her loss. So the thing is, when you when you started talking about her, you didn't like her loss. I was like, all right, this is just personal now. This, this is just this is just about the now that I know it's it's really about the McDonald's now. <laughs> like I was like, her loss is, is come on, you, you can't hate on her loss. What which album was that? That's the one before. Well, it's, that's the one with twenty one. That's the one with twenty one. Yeah, that's the one. With, I, I feel like you can't like I, I, if you say all right, CLB was kind of like CLB what I did think about it. Is I don't listen to Drake. Like okay, sure okay. Drake so Drake's new albums, but even still, Drake is trying to be something that he's really not, and that's why I can't get with it. It's not, it's not authentic. Okay, what is he trying to be that he's not? 
well, on this 21 Savage album, it sounds like he's trying to be a thug. Okay. I feel that. Um, I mean, I don't think he's... I think that there are people around him who would... I don't really, like, think this whole hair loss, toxic king shit is cute. Like, grow up. You know what's so funny? Okay, this is that's a great segue. I mean, I, I I think that um this is a great segue because I've been thinking a lot lately about, like, are you in a relationship now or no? Yeah, I am. That's what I, th- I thought you were. Um, with a man or a woman? A girl. A girl. Okay, I thought I thought that was the case. Um, I think that <laughs> I'm in this age band now, and I've been saying this on every episode pretty much, where I feel like guys in that 20 to 32 age band, it's like everyone had a secret meeting, like, yo, we're going to get in relationships now. Because if you look back, I feel like five years ago, what was cool, considered cool, was like having quote unquote hoes, right? Like being kind of outside. And I don't know if it's the pandemic or if it's just getting older, but it definitely feels like that stuff very quickly became uncool. And like, if you look now, I think what people are promoting, guys my age, it's more like vacations and matching pajamas and like really leaning into commitment. And so I do, I, I do think that like not to, you know, I, I do think that there's a, le- a level of like, if you're still outside, if you're still in the streets at like a certain age, it kind of starts to feel very corny. Yeah. Or if, you're, if you're still glorifying it. And I'm not talking about him specifically, but I do think that like, I've been noticing a lot lately that like, they're like, you know, it's just like, why are you still talk- like, why do you think this is cool? Why are you make, you go out and date a 20 year old, 21 year old, and then make an album. I never liked you. Like bro, that's like wait. He did, is that was that about a twenty? I mean, I don't I don't age gap shame because I feel like that's sort of like a like I and this, okay. It's funny I said this, I said this in a in another um in the in the episode with Zeta Morrison um with um and I, and I immediately like I was like crap. I was gonna make like a, an insert for the episode because I like I've had two girlfriends. One was one of them was a year younger than me, and one was a year older than me. So I'm not like saying this because I have some sort of preference, but I do think you know when I see the like, sort of people because it's the same sort of cancel culture people who will be like oh this person's dating this person of that age and i feel like the whole age gap thing is about like people like oh like power dynamics and i feel like if you strip it away right like every relationship i feel like it's the only power dynamic that we care about is that one right like no one's ever like oh like a rich person shouldn't date a poor person because there's a power dynamic there or like a black person a white person should date a black person because black people you know like white people have more power i mean i guess we also like I guess there's two. It's age gaps and like corporate, like, you know, a senior person, like a workplace thing. I guess those are two ones that people kind of take issue with. And I just think that if you, like, if the issue is power dynamics, then like there's a lot of relationships. And then I also think that like, you know, like if you think about some of the relationships that we glorify, Chrissy Teigen met John Legend, like working for him. She was a music, she's on his music video. They have. I don't glorify that relationship. Well, I. But people, you, I mean, people kind of started hating on her. Uh, people turned on her. The internet will, t- they're not loved Chrissy Teigen and then turned on her with a vengeance at one point. Uh, yeah. But like people used to, you know, like John Legend, like, you know, big Obama supporter, big, Demo- you know, Democrat, him and Kanye fell out over Kanye, like Kanye's politics. I mean, I, I try not to, I mean, I try not to politics make me, you know, interfere with any relationship. Although, I mean, that most of my friends are all the same sort of politics. But, um, I think that, you know, Chrissy Teigen and, and him, they met on the set of a music video. Like, that's a power dynamic. She was a dancer on his music video. They slept together the first night. Um, Obama, Michelle and Barack Obama, um, Michelle was his assigned mentor at the, law, at the law firm that he was working at. And he kept asking her out. And he, she kept saying no. And then he eventually, she eventually was like, okay, fine. And, like, if you look at that today, that would be a, a, a you know, a Me Too situation. Um, and then Jay and, Con- I mean, Jay, it's funny. Like, you'll see people with Beyonce, Avi's kind of talking about Drake as a, Drake is this and Drake is that. And it's like, my neck, like, you know, Jay Z. I mean, and I, so I don't like, I I think the relationship between Jay Z and Beyonce is a lot, is it's something to. Yeah. I, and like, <laughs> so I, I think that, I think for, I, I, I agree with the whole idea of like past a certain age, it, it, it does feel like not even those rap. I, I guess those rappers, like, it's tough. Cause, like, they have a certain lifestyle, but it is interesting. Like, you know, you see like J. Cole. I is a father. Kendrick is a father. I, I mean, Drake is a father too. Drake is a father too. Consistently. Well, so, sorry, I, I have to correct myself. All four of them are fathers. Drake is a father. Future is a father. But I think like Kendrick and Cole, I believe, have like serious long term partners that they're. I think I don't know about Cole, but I think so. Yeah, I know Kendrick does. But like, what I was gonna say is, I think there 
there are power dynamics in a lot of relationships, yes. But I think for you to consistently date girls that are much younger than you, you like to exploit a certain power dynamic, and that's predatory. That's fair. That's a that's a fair take. I mean, I think um, I don't know. I think that like again, I have to clarify. I've had two girlfriends. One was a year younger than me. One was a year older than me. I'm not like playing. You know, I'm not like oh, this is like I'm. I feel personally attacked. I think that if we if I think if we're to believe that like okay, women have agency, right? Like women can because I do think like this happened with Billie Eilish where people are like oh, you're getting a, like you're getting groomed, and she's like no, I'm not. And you could say okay, she thinks that now, but she's gonna think that later. But I think we 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 like believe in women's rights to kind of make their own decisions. And so I do think that like that has to be kind of a little bit all encompassing, right? Like I can't say like, Oh, you, you're old enough to kind of decide to have a child or decide to not have a child or decide, you know, make these decisions for yourself, but you're not old enough to date, decide that you want to date future. Especially like you, I mean, you have enough information on future and his track record. Like you can make an informed decision. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I don't really care either way. Like, you know, whenever I saw him dating, the girl that was much younger than him. I wasn't like, oh my God, fuck them. Da, da, da. But I you, like you, you had to rescue her. I could, I could never be, he would never just be someone that I would be a real, a, a big fan of. I could, I don't just think that type of shit is cool. I feel you. I feel you. So I was going to listen to this and be like, oh, you're just defending these uh, people. Um, which maybe I am. Um, cause I do love future and Drake and Cole and Kendrick, but I, I do think that like this, like maybe it's different for them because I, and and that's the thing. Like I don't can't I don't cancel future. Like you know, I'm right. saying that it's just like not something that I would like lean towards. Like I love Kendrick. Like you know, and then even too like I liked his newest album. I wasn't playing it all the time, but like I respect it. Like, but I still like. It's not just like. I'm like, oh, yeah, I only listen to Kendrick and I wouldn't listen to a Future song. If Future dropped a song that I liked, I would listen to it. Yeah, but- I, I respect that. I think that people, and even me maybe, I'm like, people, it's rare for me to even talk to somebody who can kind of criticize someone but not cancel them, right? Like, who can be like, I, I disapprove of this behavior, but I'm still going to consume the content or I'm still going to, you know. I don't care that much. But- like, it's not even that I just disapprove of the behavior. Like, it's just what I think about it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like, for me personally, and even like we were talking about Drake, it's just getting corny. Like it's getting like whack. Like it's like I feel like there's no growth. And I think that's something that people have been talking about with like the with Scissors album. Like we don't really see growth in you. And I think that realistically, people do like to get a certain kind of message out of music. And I was just talking about it on Twitter recently. Like I think music should either have like a strong message or ease or else the person should be like extremely confident. I feel like when people make music and they're like really confident in what they're doing and it's like, just like, you know, like when Lil Wayne was like in his prime, when Future was in his prime, when Drake was in his prime, when all these niggas were in their prime, they really was confident and we could like feel it off of the type of music that they was making. I think that eventually people just lose that confidence and then it's like they find other ways to sell you music and I don't buy Hmm. it. You know, it's interesting. I think that, Rappers just have to be confident. And I remember, I was, I, like a year ago, I was talking to uh, Maxwell's manager Toby, and he, you know, managed Mona Leo Guapa. I was like, I'm thinking about starting a podcast. I was like, but you know, everybody has a podcast now. He's like, yeah, but that's like saying I'm not gonna rap because everybody raps. I was like, wow, I never thought about it like that. Like rappers really have to sit here and be like, yo, I don't care if a thousand, you know, because we all live in a world where, you know, the barber is a rapper, and like the, I mean, for the past however many years, especially now, I mean, I know you produce a little bit, like, like, with, like as much as much like Fruit Loops is boomed and like just. People can record stuff off an of iPhone, and so it is. You do have to have a, a level of uh, a level of kind of bravado. I guess even the same thing, probably. I'm sure for designing, right? Like everyone, like everyone has a clothing line. Like I'm sure, like someone probably told you that. I, I'm sure at some point, like, oh, that's that's cute. You're gonna have a clothing line. Like I talked to, um, I don't know if you know them, Angel and Dran. They're these twin DJs um, from that are, from New York, and you know, like they're talking about how they were kind of embarrassed because they went to Dartmouth. They went to like a fancy Ivy League school to say that they were DJs because it's kind of like, well, why did I go to college for? Like, what, like, I mean, just the idea of, oh, that's so cute. Like, oh, that's cute. You're following your dream. Like, you know, people that sort of shady, like, oh, like, oh, congrats. Like, I could never do that. You know what I mean? Like, um, but yeah, I think you do have to have that level of, um, this is going to think, this is funny because I don't know if he's going to hear this, but Drake definitely is because I feel like he just hears everything that people say about him. <laughs> but I think, yeah, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't know that I never liked you was about a, a specific person. It is kind of funny, like sometimes, I'm not like sure that it was. Uh, but I'm saying that regardless, like 
it's just a certain like image that you want to put out. Like yeah, it's, it's the, the a, toxic king. I mean, what do you, so what do you, so you don't like toxic R and B, right? I remember that there's that song, that division song that came out that had the, the crazy I, I backlash. Like, like if you like, for example, there are some Brent Fayez songs that I like where he's saying dumb shit, but I like the song. I like the melody. I like the beat. I, I overall like the song. It like came across in a way for me to like receive it. But like, I'm just saying like, for me, like, honestly, I never just been a super big future fan, but. Okay. I, come on. 2016 like, when he like, dropped like, monster. I'm saying I can respect like when yeah. he dropped like fire ass music. But I'm not going to like then now go and listen to this new shit he put out when he's saying shit that is just like, it's not the top, like the content of the music is not, it doesn't stimulate me. I feel you. I think it is. I do. I do think like this does tie a little bit. I get in the way right now with like the fact that they have fans and that their fans are going to just go play their music. And I, I'm just not that kind of like consumer. I listened to the, the first few tracks of the Scissor album and I liked it, but I'm not like a huge Scissor. I mean, I liked uh, the the what was her last uh, that that one a uh, Control, um, but yeah, I saw people on online saying it was an album about how she doesn't like herself, and and it was like very um, people saying that it was like no growth. Um, it's I, I do think that like like when Jay Z dropped 444, it was like oh okay, like this is Ace rapping about fatherhood and infidelity, and like it, there is something cool about watching artists age, and I do think that it like as much as I do like her loss, I do see what you're saying in the sense that like, it's, it's not like rap about, and I, it's funny because in Lemon Pepper Freestyle, he rapped about like PTA meetings and stuff. And it's like, okay, maybe it's going to be like, maybe that's going to kind of be more of a topic, but yeah, I think it, like you do want to see some yeah, sort like, of, you know, when, when Drake dropped so far gone, it sounded so real. Like, you know, like it was like, you could tell that's like really where he was at in his life. Like he like, wanted to be in a certain place like the music it just felt good like and I just feel like now he's not making music in that same way he's not just being like okay like I'm inspired to say this or like I'm I'm looking for like the type of beats that I really like I feel like he's just doing like what he thinks everyone is gonna buy in math I think that I mean, I think people are going to buy, like, you know, he, people, I think people are going to buy whatever, but I think, like, whatever he puts out. And I think that's why it's sad that he but, wouldn't push himself to do well, whatever he wants. It's funny. I will say, I, I didn't, like, house music isn't for me, but I remember I, I thought of, and you're going to probably hate me for this, but I, I thought of, honestly, never mind as, like, his Yeezus in the sense of, like, this was not for me. I mean, actually, I like Yeezus, but, like, you, like, he finally took a risk. Like, I feel like for so long. I thought that was risky. I think a house album from a rapper is risky. I think you don't think a house album from a rapper is risky. Drake, he has hella house songs. Um, okay, <laughs> take care. Take care with take care with Rihanna on take uh, on the album. Take care is house. But, like, I mean, been like when when like better find your love, find your love, and like all that mm, shit. Like, that's a, that's made- dance. That's dance. But, so he knew like he had the pathway to like make that. And like, I feel, but I think that it was like I it wasn't. Think- it wasn't. It was never going to do numbers the way like. Even a CLB or like a view. I mean, that views has been, I think, his best, at least like quickest selling. Uh, I think that's like the last rap album. I think to do a million in a week. But I think, uh, I mean, I think that was like him. Like I, I do think I agree. Like because I think that's one thing you can say about Kanye is that he takes risks, right? Like making a gospel album, um, do, making like Yeezus was so transgressive. Like just the way it's like it felt like it was assaulting you almost. Like the, just that first, you know. When I, first, when I first heard Yeezus, I didn't like it for like the first like two days or something. And I remember I went and I was just like, damn, because I was just so in love with my beautiful dark twisted fantasy. Like I was just so ready for like, you know, and I was sad. And then I went to this pool party with like, actually it was like some white people there. And White, white people that love Jesus and they love Kendra too. Houston too. And like, yeah. And they was just gassing it. Like they was like, what? No, like this shit is fire. And like, just the way they listened to it made me like listen to it differently. And I was like, and I just loved it. And I used to feel like when I listened to Yeezus, I was driving with like my middle finger out the window. Like, you know, it was just like a big, like, fuck you album. And I appreciate it so much now. And I, I love that Kanye kept, and even like with his gospel album, I didn't play it for like a year. I never had played it. And then one of my, that's, I think people feel like, oh, Brianna's just such a Kanye fan. 
I really just <laughs> like a lot of the things that he does and I do like just love him and I'm that kind of person like when I support someone I support them but yeah. like I'm not just like you know like I said I didn't play the I never played none of the Sunday service albums for like a year and yeah, I, was, I mean, Jesus was very, I mean, I'm looking at the track list now, like, on site, I am a God, hold my liquor, blow. I never really like bum leaves or I am a God, but, and I mean, send it up was different, like, black skin had, oh yeah, new slaves, yeah, yeah, I'm in it. I never really like guilt trip. Um, Bound to was so fire. But yeah, I mean, I don't know, I think that, I think the house album was a risk. Um, I think that. Compare it, to, I mean, if you want to say you compare it to Jesus and the fact that Jesus was a risk, cool, but. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. Not, I don't like. I don't like. I actually, I mean, and I'm a big Drake fan, but I like. I like Jesus. Like, whereas I didn't really listen to. The, I mean, I listen to the, that Jimmy Cooks. But I don't listen to the house thing really at all. Uh, I'm not like Sticky and Jimmy Cooks. So it's just the, the rap songs on it. Um, but I do. I, I'm like okay. Like that's for someone who people feel like is, is so preoccupied with his streaming numbers to kind of zag the way that, like you go my beautiful dark twisted fantasy and then Jesus, you know, is like to go CLB and then like. Cause I was expecting a rap album when he's I was like, oh, there's gonna be a, a album, a surprise release. So when it was a house thing, I was like, okay, but I feel like that's him taking a risk. But I do think that like, I do think that people want to see I think one it was like a so calculated risk. I don't think it was a risk in the sense of like, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the two like, knocks. He knows he can do whatever he wants, but I think I, that like what he's not doing is like putting a lot into his music. Like a lot to like really, really, really make an album. I I love like albums that are like cinematic that like feel like fully, fully based. What's your favorite? What's your favorite uh, Kendrick album? I'll probably give it to Damn. Okay, we're we're all right. We're locked in because I feel like a lot of people would either say Good Kid, Mad. City. Well, people say To Pimp a Butterfly, To Pimp a Butterfly, or um, Good Kid, Mad. City. But I think Damn is like incredible. Like I think Damn is some of the best. Like XXX that like really really had me, but also I love Section Eighty. Like I would probably play, play that next. Truly from Kendrick, I love yeah. Section Eighty. I love Good Kid, Mad City too. Like, oh, I feel also like- the quote: "Whether whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right." That was Henry Ford, apparently, according to the internet. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, yeah, Damn just had such like I feel like Damn had such high highs, like to the point where I'm like, oh, like some of these things are the biggest. Like uh, some of the best rapping I've heard, right? Like um, feel. Um, there's one that I just was so. Oh, fair. I think fair is like one of the be- greatest rap songs I've ever heard. Like you know, just to talk about like, I think that the reason I think there are two reasons people won't put Drake. I was talking about this with the Vibe reporter, uh, the, the hip hop reporter at Vibe. He's like a huge Drake fan, and I was saying I think there are two reasons people won't give Drake a certain amount of respect when it comes to rap. One, a little bit is the Quentin Miller thing, but like it's not even that much that anymore because people kind of know that like all right, a lot of rappers have a little bit of help and like Quinn Miller, like you can say what you want, but like it's kind of like Jay's Dame saying make, oh, he made Jay-Z. Okay. Make another Jay-Z. Right. Like if, like if Quinn Miller can't write stuff for himself to, to do what, to do what the stuff that he did for, you know, he work with and people know that music is collaborative. I think that's one issue, but I think the other issue really is that like rap is always intertwined with like some sort of like consciousness, like political consciousness and Drake doesn't have, like, you know, if you think about, like, Tupac, Brenda's Got a Baby, Trapped, um, you know, like, I think one of the reasons people put Tupac so high up. That, like, that Drake is not real. He's not, like, he's not being, like, authentic anymore. He's more so thinking, he thinks in a way of, like, what's going to be, like, massive instead of, like, what do I actually want to say? But I think also he, he had that bar where he's, like, you know, I'm getting so rich, my music's not not even relatable. And I think maybe like you're like like you're, when you say okay, like on say what's real, he was saying you know he was really being you know on, on uh so far gone he was really being real. I think because at that point in his life, it was like I'm trying to make it and like you know I have this phantom and my mom doesn't like it. I park at three houses down and et cetera et cetera. And I think now like his life is going to Turks and Caicos every other weekend and like just you know signing a five hundred million dollar deal. Like but see, like I think that's what his that- life is. I think, like, too, you know, that's another reason. Like, Drake is – so then he tries to, like, also make himself relatable in the ways that, like, a lot of other rappers do, but he's not that. Like, you know, like, he really is. Like you said, he's basically a mixed boy. Is he even mixed? Oh, yeah, he is. A mixed boy from Canada. He used to be an actor. He started rapping. He was good at rapping. Now he's a a big rapper. 
but he doesn't have like the same story as a lot of these rappers, but he tries to like go and match himself with them to be like relatable. I mean, I, 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 okay, I, that's one thing I, I have to disagree with because I do think that he was always kind of pretty naked about or pretty transparent about like he didn't come from the like that he think because I mean, he could not be transparent about it because he was an actor on Degrassi, right? So he could never really. I mean, I guess he has started from the bottom, but like his bottom, I don't know. I, I think that no, 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 he I'm wasn't sure. rich, right? Like just in his styles of music, like, oh. he, like you know, just whatever is cool at the moment, he will hop on that wave. But then I think that his sound is also is because I think even like if you think about like when he, Kanye and Fifty Cent went went head to head, which I think was kind of when you know the massacre versus I want to say um, graduation, right? And graduation outsold the massacre by like a significant amount. And I remember it being like, okay, that was, I feel like that was the watershed moment where it's like, okay, rap is going to be less about the streets. Oh, now the streets are really coming back. Like I listen to a lot of Dirk and ESTG and 42 Doug a lot, but like rap is going to be less about the streets and more about this backpack relatable stuff where Kanye is rapping about hating his job on spaceship. I mean, I, I mean, spaceship is on college dropout, but it's like about dropping out of college and it's about basically stuff that way more like a few people can relate to like shooting and selling drugs and stuff. A lot of people can relate to like missing your ex because you went to college and she stayed home or dropping out or like hating your job. And so I think that Kanye, and I think that's one of the reasons that like him and Kanye had this weird relationship. Cause like Drake kind of was able to be the next, like Kanye kicked the door open a little bit. Right. And like as much as, although I'll give Drake some credit where like, if you look at the dates, like so far gone and um, so far gone, didn't drop so long after 808s and heartbreaks. So I think people would be like, Oh, like, you know, AOS and Heartbreak directly, you know, there wouldn't be no Drake. But if you look at it, So Far Gone, like, AOS and Heartbreak dropped November 24th, 2008. So Far Gone dropped, um, I want to say, when did it drop? Oh, February 13th, 2009. So it was, like, three months. But I do think that, like, that sort of relatable rap, right? Like, oh, like, my I'm rapping about my parents, and, like, I'm rapping about missing a girl, I don't know, I think that people have taken that. And if you look at like Jack Harlow, if you look at even just a sonic thing of like rapping and singing, like I think people, I think it's hard to say that Drake copies when like people copy Drake so much too. Or like people, as far as like his, even just from the, the lyrical content, like being sort of like kind of relatable rap or relatable music. And then also just like um, singing and rapping and all that stuff. I mean, whatever, this is a very, uh, I mean, I don't know. But I, I do think that like you're right in the sense that like Cole and Kendrick have a certain level of like, I think even just both of them being married or having long-term partners and like, they're not in, like they're not living the future in Drake life. And there's something that, that feels a little bit more refined to that. Right. That just feels a little bit more elevated. That feels a little bit more adult and like, okay, I've, I've watched these artists grow. And I think that it would be nice to see like, like Dirk had this song called unhappy father's day about how he's like a horrible father. And it was just so like, it was dope. Cause it's like, Oh, this is like, this is real, right? Mm-hmm. Like, this is really talking about, like, missing, you know, I, I do think that, like, it's tough. Like, if you, if you, I don't know if you listen to Ghostface Killer, he has a song called All That, All that I Got Is You with, I think, Mary J. Blige. And it's, like, such a, it's about his mom, right? Like, it's about how much he loves his mom. And, like, if you think about even, like, uh, Tupac with Dear Mama, right? Like, I do think that, like, those, if those artists, like, if Drake could have a Dear Mama or if Drake could have, like, a, you know, it's like a political, it's tough because it anything political would feel kind of forced from Drake, but like some sort of, you know, like we're going to be all right, right? Like a, a political anthem. Like, I think that's the thing. I think it has to be something for Drake to like actually care about, but I feel like also, yeah, I don't know. I do think that it's just like kind of like the life that he lives. I don't know. I think that. Yeah, maybe it is. Like, he, he lives that life of just chasing hoes, being in different vacations, da 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 whatever, whatever he does. And so that's what he's talking about. And maybe it is that, like, I would rather see, like... Um, his 444, right? Like, his his sort of... I don't, if you, I don't know if you listen to the Jay-Z album 444, but it was very, like... He's rapping about Blue, right? Like, he's rapping about his daughter, and he's rapping about him and uh beyonce is like marriage struggles and it's like oh okay like that's just a different you know anyway um okay so wait you're in london now so tell us how you got to london and you're also like doing more styling now like i think i mean you still do matt i presume but like you're you're like styling you're in london did you like meet a girl and like just whisk away to london like fall in love like what happened (laughs) no (laughs) that was not that was like the least convincing no i've ever heard 
I don't know. I don't think does. So basically, your question is: Did my relationship influence me moving to London? I guess it's like, how did you end up in London? And like my like guess, because it it, it seems to coincide is that you met somebody. I mean, I think you were kind of getting into styling already. I think. I mean, I think. I mean, if, if you're a, if you're if you have a clothing line, you kind of are a stylist. It's just on a mass level, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I know that you got more into styling, and I also know that you moved to London, and that you have a girlfriend. So I wonder if all these three things are somehow related. <laughs> um, maybe, but I will say that my girlfriend does not live in London. Um, so I moved to London, got my own apartment out here. I, yeah, I do feel like I just was traveling a lot whenever I was living in LA, like all of like 2021, I was like not in LA. Where were you? I was like in Ghana a lot. I went to London and yeah. So 2021, I was basically like in Ghana. I did go to London, but then like 2022, I've been like so many places, like just Ghana, London, Paris, like three times, Barcelona, like twice, Um, Amsterdam, like I've just been like traveling so much like on this side. So like I just saw my life building more over here and it's just like too much to go all the way back to LA. And then also like I didn't see my life like developing in the same way in LA anymore. So how'd you get into styling? Um, I've been wanting the style. Like, I've always wanted to work with, like, an artist because I love music. So, like, um, it's just something that, you know, I've been manifesting. <laughs> Who are some I, people you've worked with? I remember, I feel like I want to say a name, but I can't, I'm not 100% sure. But it was, like, a, 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 female, a female rapper. Yeah, so I first did Ruby. I mean, that was, I guess, like, my first a styling job and she just like randomly hit me up and was like hey I have a music video and she needed like three looks and we just like pulled it off and it was so cute but like that's literally I've actually done like some other like smaller things before like I even I did a girl from Ghana um, her name was Molly I like went and directed her whole music video and like styled the whole thing like in 2021 and so um it's really always been something that I really wanted to do. And I've always wanted to like work with an artist because I feel like I have a lot of ideas, like when it comes to like creative direction all around. And sometimes like I've been able to like flex that a little bit with Matt, but like it's also limited because I'm like promoting clothes. So like to just work with a girl, I feel like I've been like excited to do that for like a long time. Okay, that's dope. That's dope. And you, I mean, but you still, and you still do Matt, right? Yeah. Well, okay. actually, I haven't really been doing any, doing much with Matt this year, but I do plan to like drop some new stuff next year. That's good. So that's what you're up to. Well, I feel like we covered. I'm trying to think. Hmm. Like I, I usually talk about dating, but I guess. Well, how'd you guys meet? Like, how'd you like? Oh well, we met in Ghana. Just like online, you have, have you, you you haven't done a girlfriend reveal, have you? No. Wow, that means, that means it's really real. Wow, <laughs> that means it's like you know when people when people post it everywhere. I mean, I'm a little bit half half being serious, but when people post it everywhere, it's like, what are you trying to prove? You know, like what are you? Yeah, you know? I do think that a lot has come from like I think it's cool that like our relationship isn't public, just because like it's like. It just doesn't need to be, like, you know. This is the first time you've, like, been in a relationship with a woman? I actually had another girlfriend in Houston for, like, two years. Okay. So you're, like, a relationship person. Like, two-year relationship, four-year relationship, like... Yeah, I love relationships. I've been I do, too. I've already been dating for, like, a year and a half. Wait, that you're currently? Yeah. Oh, I have no idea. Yeah, like, we met in, like, March 2021. Oh, wow. See, I, I post a lot. I've been posting a lot lately about like how, you know, just relationships or just wanting to be in matching pajamas, all that stuff. I'm trying yeah. to manifest it. You know, I'm trying to manifest. I really, I guess I really do feel like. See, exactly with that. Do you believe it? Do you really think that you believe you can have that? I think I, I okay. I think that like, 
when I post about it, I'm like half joking. I, I think I do want it, but I think I want to like but situate. You, you know, I, I didn't get this podcast booming. I didn't get a, a bar stool deal. It'll be easier to, for you to believe it. Yeah, because I think. Well, I just think that like I'm always. I don't know. I think there's there's beauty in building with somebody else, but I'm sort of like I need to grind to get to where I want to go, and then somebody can hop aboard. Okay. I'm not like more. I'm not really like a because I think that like I'll be so if I'm trying to get to somewhere. I'll be so focused on getting there and also I'll be like unhappy that I'm not there that like, I can't give attention as much to like, I wouldn't be, a, I don't know. I think, I think I need to, I think I've always, I think there's some people who like want to like build with somebody and there's some people who just want to get to a destination and then like, and then find somebody when they reach that destination. And I've, I'm more so the latter, but then like I met somebody like, you know, during the pandemic and we dated for like a year. Like it was really, it was like, it was very peaceful and it made me think, okay, like I, I, this is dope. Like we didn't fight. It was very chill. Like, you know, it made me realize that I think that I used to have a sort of cynical view of relationships where I was like, okay, like anything that I would want a partner for, like, let's say like a girlfriend, I can, there's like an app for that, right? Like if I want food, I can order food. If I want, like, there's, there's DoorDash, there's whatever. Even if you want like sex, you can, there's, you can find that. And I think that it made me realize, oh, wait, there's certain things that you can't, like, you can't, there's no Uber for, like, emotional support. I mean, I guess there's, like, better help, maybe. But, like, there's just certain things that a partner can give you that you can't, you know, just, like, little things, right? Like, just having somebody, like, you like, hang out with all day and cook and, like, respond to your texts. You know, I don't know. Just, like, I sound very corny right now, maybe. But I think that, I think that, because I, I had a girlfriend in college and I had a girlfriend in the pandemic. And I feel like. I joke that college doesn't count and also pandemic relationships don't count. So I've really never been in a relationship, but I think that like college is like, it's a, a unique situation. You're always together. The pandemic, I guess it was that too. Cause everything was closed and we kind of lived together. But I do think that I saw the beauty that relationship showed me the beauty in relationships sort of where I'm like, okay, this is like cool. Just somebody like you can just do things together. I don't know. Am I, is that, am I making sense? Of course. I think that, you know, a lot of guys are coming to, like, a lot of my guy friends seem to, like, be interested in relationships now. And I think, um, yeah, it comes with a lot to think about. I definitely think that, like, even no matter what, like, understanding relationships and, like, the point of them and, like, how to have, like, healthy ones is something that everyone has to, like, come to terms with like on their own because I feel like for a lot of times really like people even like deny that they like need or want love and like you know support and attention and stuff like that when it's like you come to realize that you do like those things and then you have to feel like then you have to figure like okay how can I get this in like a genuine way and then like how can I have this with someone that I actually want to give that back to like yeah also sorry I didn't mean to I think that also like as you get older, like the woman you're dating, they have more experience in relationships. So they're, they're kind of like better at it. Like they, like they know how to like do like, you know, maybe do something for your birthday or just do little things that I think, I also think like as you get older, people take them more seriously. Right. And so it's, you know, I also think as you get older, you get less, I mean, even just physically, right. You like, as a, and I mean, maybe this is like a masculine thing, but like as a guy, you can just have lots of sex when you're younger. And as you get older, like, that's just not, you know, like just physically <laughs> not going to be as much of a thing. And so I think that like, as that becomes less of a relationship, it's more about like watching the same show together and like cooking. And like that stuff is so much more sustainable and it's so much more of a solid foundation to have a relationship built upon versus like just, Oh, we just a, a physical, like physical gratification. Or even just like having the same types of goals, like, you know, wanting the same types of things out of life and, yeah, although it's tough though, I think that as you get to this age, like you also want one, but then like the, the woman around that age, like you're not dating for fun anymore. Cause like if you're like 30, 31, 32, you're like, okay, I, I want to like have kids someday. And that becomes, I don't know, it's, it, it feels like unless you're going to like propose in the next year, like you're wasting her time, <laughs> um, basically. Uh, but maybe that's the pressure that we put on ourselves. Um, I mean, I have never been the kind of person to really date for fun. Like I've kind of always like, I've had moments and I think honestly, those are the times when I really like end up finding somebody that I want to like really be with. But like, I don't know. I don't think that like, 
I don't really care or think that much about like just being married, but I just like to, you know, just having someone that like you feel like we both feel the same and we're like, we both want the same things. Like, you know. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm, other, go ahead. From each other. I've, I'm glad that like it's not just me that you're saying that you're seeing that amongst your male friends too. So I do think we're in like, like I think we're in a couple of vibe shifts. The vibe shift, first vibe shift is that, like you said, canceling just feels like very 2019, 2020. Like you said, even nowadays when you say things that like maybe in 2019, 2020, people would have kind of thought, like jumped on you and be like, yo, Brie, I can't believe, you know, report her account. Like this is what's wrong. You know, it's kind of way chiller. And I think the other vibe shift is I do feel like guys, it almost feels like the, the more of a dog the guy was, like the more in the streets the guy was, the more now the guy is like leaning into relationships commitment. Like I do think like, even what you're talking about, like with Future and Drake, I do think we're in a, in a, like, I don't know if it's just me, if it's just being like kind of in that early thirties, you know, late like 28 to 32 kind of age range, but it does really feel like that stuff is just not cool. Like if I, like if you see a guy post a picture, with like his arm around two girls, it looks mad corny. Like it just looks like, what are you trying to like, what are you trying to prove? Like, why? Like, you yeah. must, like, it, it, it seems, it seems insecure. Yeah. And I think that's good though, because I feel like black men, honestly, you guys need that. I think that black men need to find other things that they think that are cool besides like, you know, looking tough, going to the club, having bitches. Like, you know, cause honestly, I talk about this a lot with my friends. Like, I think that, like, it's sad, like, the way that I feel like a lot of of other Black men's characteristics have to be, like, quieted so that they can, like, then just show this, like, other side of themselves. And I even seen it happen, (laughs) I feel like, with, like, my little brother. Like, you know, I watched him grow up. I know everything he's been through for the most part, you know. And, like, um, I How How old is he now? He's 20 now. Okay. Yeah, and I still see him, like, just hardening himself in some way. And I wish that Black men didn't have to do that. And I feel like Black women don't. And I think that that's why, like, I always say, like, I know girls that are 20 that have music careers, like, fucking hair companies, do ha- they or they do hair, or they do lashes, or they set, like, you know, like, they just think of, like, so many other things. Yeah. And I feel like... Black men have like limited themselves in a lot of ways. It's funny. I have the first episode I'm doing, I'm putting out is this, this dude, Demetrius Harmon. I don't know if you know, he has this brand called You Matter, Meech mm-hmm. on Mars. And he's like very big about mental health and, you know, cause he's been public about like having self harmed and stuff. Uh, I talked to him about like how being vulnerable as a black man. Cause I think it's so hard to be vulnerable as a black, like black men just aren't vulnerable. I think that was one of the craziest things when Kobe died. Like, I used to always be like the person who's like, yo, I would never, like, I don't get people crying when celebrities die. Like, you don't know these people. And when Kobe died, I fell to the ground. Like, I was, I was ugly crying, like, bawling. And I remember, like, seeing, it was my first time seeing black men cry, really. Like, you saw Shaq, like, you saw, I mean, Michael Jordan cried at the, at the, uh, at the memorial. Um, Shaq was bawling on TV. Like, all the, like, I'd never seen, I mean, you saw these NBA players crying. You saw Doc Rivers crying. Like it was my first time seeing black men just be so vulnerable openly. And I think that obviously, like I'm still sad that Kobe died, but it was very like there's something that's almost like I've never seen this before. This is I don't I don't want to use the word refreshing because I'll give anything to give. I, I joked the other day. I was like, if you said that I could flip a switch and make actually no, this is about another thing. But I said if you could, if you told me I could flip a switch and um, make it so COVID didn't happen, or I could flip a switch and make it so Chris Paul didn't pull his hamstring and make the Rockets lose the 27 18 championship. I would, I would do the Chris Paul thing, but I also would say that for the, for Kobe. Um, but yeah, I think that like, you know, he, he said something that's very similar to what you said, Demetrius Harmon, which is that like, he never really had issue being vulnerable, but he has more of an issue like th- with masculinity. Right. Cause like black men kind of expressing masculinity so much is about aggression. And he's like, not you know, trying to balance, like asserting yourself, but not being aggressive. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. It's, it's like, even if you think about male relationships, we were talking about this too, about like, and maybe this is, we were wrong about this, but I feel like women have kind of more real relationships than men do seem, it seems like, I feel like men, like so many of our conversations are about like, well, LeBron dropped 30 last night. Oh, the Lakers lost. Ha ha, man, the Rockets lost. Um, Bro, you heard that new Dirk? Like, we're not really talking about like, how, like what's going on in your life? Like, how do you feel? Like, it reminds me of, there's this one viral tweet 
that like a man will like like a man will go through a breakup and he'll be like man, I still beat though it's like nigga you are in immense pain <laughs> Like, you know, they'll be like, yeah, I still hit. It's like, dog, you love that woman, bro. Like, you, 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 you are actually incredibly sad right now. You don't need to put up this front, like, oh, yeah, I still beat. Like, yeah, like, I'm good. It's like, how do we get to a point where black men feel, or just men in general, but I, I can speak to being, you know, an African American man or, you know, a black man. Um, I guess an African, but I think that, like, how do you, yeah, it's like, like, how do you get to that point where, like, we're, we're okay just saying that we're not okay, you know? Yeah. And I think a lot of things like you're okay with expressing interest in like different things and like thinking that that's cool. And like, you know, just like, cause even like you just said, like men talk about sports, like when you guys probably have a lot of different interests that you could talk about, like, you know, and it's just like, I think that, that, you know, black men, I think that y'all are kind of waking up a bit. Well, I, I'm I'm happy that you said that you dated a woman before because I was like, man, did black men like mess up so bad that you had to you had to start dating women like were we that bad? Oh my god, I not nah, I really don't see it in that way, and I love men, and I I like if me and um, my current girlfriend didn't work out, like I don't think I would date another girl. Like I would still date men, like um, and I believe in black men, like you know, I really really do, as do a lot of black women. <laughs> I'm happy you said that you love black man. You love because I think that one thing, like, not to rationalize or not to say like you know we're talking about the whole age gap thing. I think that one, I saw a person kind of like online somewhere kind of per, saying why they prefer a younger woman, and I think that, and I remember I saw this on like the girl I dated where, like at a certain age, let's say you're 30, you've been dating men for like 10 to 15 years depending on when you started dating, and like you've probably had your share of heartbreaks, your share of being done dirty, being cheated on. I remember when I, around the time we started, I start, started talking to this started off as like kind of a friendship. Like we were just hanging out during the pandemic, like went hiking a couple of times. So everything was closed. And we ended up starting dating. But I remember her saying like, she was like tired of dating. Like t- she like kind of like she hated, almost like she hated niggas. Basically. She always said she hates niggas. Um, and that like, just being tired of like, basically I don't want to tell another guy, like my favorite color. Like I don't want to tell another guy, like what I do for a living and like what my job and like, just, it's I'm just like just being tired, like having just gone through like you know like you do you know like because every relationship kind of starts off a little bit of the same. Like you have like a really cute, you know, like me and her. I think we had like we went hiking. We had like a little dance battle. I think her next relationship, she she and the guy had like a like a rap battle. You know, like just like like something cute happens. Like you have these sparks, and then like it ends. And I think that there's a level of like at that like exhaustion. You know, like I'm just tired of this. I'm tired of dating. I'm tired of niggas. I don't like niggas. Like I'm tired. I don't like y'all. The only reason why I choose to, like, say, like, oh, I love Black men and I believe in Black men, and it is true, too, but, like, is because of manifestation yet again. I think that, like, you can't have good relationships if you believe that it's not real. Okay, like, you know? see, I I really, see, I, I'm glad you say that because I feel like, you know, once I started noticing that amongst certain, I will say, like, kind of Black, I don't want to speak broadly about any group, but, like, people of a certain age who have kind of been in the dating market for a while. Like you, I mean, you see like insecure is basically a show about how date, how it's hard, how dating is hard for black women in, you know, in LA, right? Like Molly's going through it. Issa's going through it. Um, and I think at some point, like if your ass was like, yo, I hate niggas, like nigga, you know, I just, I hate y'all. Then like, you're going to, I'm not even on the law of attraction thing, but like, how can you find love? How can like, you, you would, your mind is not open to that. So it's like, and it takes a lot. I was just talking to one of my friends about it the other day. Like you really have to get to a point, especially like I'm a kind of person who the type of relationship that I want is not normal. Like, you know, I want extravagant things. I want extravagant experiences. I want like, I have big goals. I want my partner to have big goals. Like, you know, so like, this is no small manifestation i guess and so right. like whenever I, when i like what i want is not easy to get so i feel like i really have to put myself in a position to believe it and this is a perfect example of like seeing how this like happens in real life because i just think when you believe in less then you will accept less like yeah. when you feel like this is all that you can have then you will like accept that and then that's what like you have so i feel like 
that's the problem that truly and honestly, there's no real, there's not a lot of good examples in the black community for like black love. Yeah. And it's yeah. It's, it's tough. Like, though, I, th- I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. I said, I think it's just hard to believe. And I think like, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Though, cause I also think we like put, like, people kind of put, a lot on like you know like it's like this person's the Barack or Michelle or like, even like Jay Z and Beyonce. And it's like it's like if Jay if Beyonce got cheated on, we all got cheated on. You know, it's like we kind of because there's so re- few examples, people kind of put a lot of baggage on the publicly out there couples. And so if those kind of if something happens with those, then it's bad. Also, I do think to to you know the person you know this, this person who said that she hates niggas, I think she would be like, oh well, I was right. Like based on her how her last relationship probably ended, she's like, yeah, but like why would I not say that? Like given how, what people do and have done, but. I don't know. I think it's like you don't want to have that attitude. Like with manifestation belief, you have to like take yourself out of like what you see and like choose to think and believe optimistically. Like, you know, it could still happen. And I think it's really, really important because like I said, people accept bullshit because they think even like in so many levels at any point in a relationship, I think it's important for you to know that you can have whatever you want. So this is a choice. You know? Right. Oh, wait. Switching gears a tiny bit because we skipped over this part of your career. You are a bit, you're low key like a AR creative director. Like, low key, I feel like people don't really know. I, like, you kind of hooked up Max on Ian Connor. And, like, I think that you, I mean, I think, right? I believe, am I just making this up? No? I didn't hook up to him, no. Oh, I thought, I, okay, I thought, I thought Ian the, the found Maxo through, like, your, tw- like, when because I think you posted him on Instagram. Um, all right, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I do feel like you've, that, that, I don't know if that happened, but I didn't know about it. Okay. Well, I, I just think that people like you, I, I feel like you've been around like a lot of artists or like have, like, cause, you know, like Maxo, like I think even like, like ASAP a little bit, like you've been in the music. I feel like you're like a tastemaker a little bit, but maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I don't have any association with ASAP either. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll, 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 we'll edit this part out. Um, <laughs> well, well, uh, I really- my, I know, I know. I I I have to do my I have to do better research. But um okay, so like the music industry, but I don't think I've like effectively like really really like done anything yet. Okay, but you make you make you make your own music a little bit though, right? I remember you were producing. Yeah. Have you been have you been getting more into that? Um not of late, but I plan to. That's good. I mean, it's, I feel like it's dope when people have like different arcs almost like and I remember like like Jay Versace posted like I remember like hearing like oh Jay Versace produced a couple songs on SZA's album I'm like wait Jay Versace like the I mean it was like a Viner YouTuber or sort of like kind of like viral he got a Grammy from producing I forgot who some stuff for but yeah a lot of people really I think maybe yeah I, yeah I had no idea that he had like a music career and I, but I think that's that's dope and when people kind of have like like you're a stylist, you're a, you're a fashion designer, you're you're producing, you know, you're producing music, you're a creative director. I think that's like really, really like wearing lots of different. Because I think I think it used to be kind of frowned upon before, like wearing different hats. But now it's like okay, like Kanye. Like when I saw how much money Adidas was making off of Yeezy, I was like, wait, what? I like, remember because when they when they said they were severing ties, they said, oh, it's gonna affect our bottom line. By I'm like, wait, y'all make how much for Yeezy? Because I never. I'm gonna be honest. I kind of. When Kanye would be like, oh, I'm a billionaire, I'm worth this much, I'm kind of like, all right. Like, I kind of rolled my eyes a little bit, like, oh, yeah, sure. And then I saw how much Adidas was making from Yeezy. I was like, oh, oh. You know how much people are just making in the fashion industry, period, right now? It's crazy. Yeah, I think music, fashion. I mean, well, fashion, maybe not. Music Music is different. Just young influencers be making crazy money off of selling bikinis. All right, well, when I make... Uh, the the podcast merch you know we're gonna have to figure out how to how to blow it up um yeah it's it is there's a lot of money in fashion even like for you to make ten thousand a month that like in 2015 dollars or i think i think it was 2015 um so when you it was it might have been I yeah that's been. like incredible well yeah that's amazing i'm trying to think if there's anything we didn't cover all right so yeah i was wrong about uh your your associations um you yeah, a year and a half into relationship. I'm very proud of you. I'm very proud of you. It's so dope to watch anyone. I guess you're not from Houston because I thought you were, but like someone who, cause I think these these industries, like I don't know about fashion, but like in entertainment, you'll meet somebody and you'll find out, oh, your mom is this famous actor or your dad. It was like, 
people kind of had things handed to them somehow, or at least like had massive legs up. And I feel like for someone from Arkansas, not to hit on Arkansas, but I mean, you know, from Little Rock, Arkansas to go, you know, to like now have lived in New York and LA and London is insane. I feel like, you know, you have to, if you don't, you have to pat yourself on the back. I'll do it for you. Um, and, oh, okay, last thing. Which one do you prefer, New York, LA, or London? Uh, as far as, like, cities? just cities. Yeah, yeah, where to live, yeah. Uh, I think LA is, like, one of the best places to live, truly and honestly. Yeah, I, I like LA a lot. Um, but I, I think, like, for the reason why I moved to London is because I just want to, like, advance. And I do feel like LA can be, I'm starting to see it kind of like a bubble. LA? Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it was. I remember like I got very deep. Like, I mean, I was like super in the scene when I first moved and it's like going to all these parties and it's like Kendall and Kylie and Bieber. And it's like, it's like you're in the scene, but it's like, what are you really doing? You know, like it's, it's a small, I think it's very easy to get caught up in that scene. Yeah, you can just like, I, I remember like, like one of the things I was feeling whenever I was in LA is like, if I stay in LA right now and dedicate myself, cause I start feeling like, you know, from traveling, I wasn't working as well, as much as I was whenever I was like in LA, like 2020 was my best year for Matt. And <clears throat> I didn't leave LA the whole year. And, well, I, and I, think, I think online sales boomed in 2020, right? Cause everyone was inside. Yeah. And so, um, but also I was like really working like 2021, 2022, I started traveling and I wasn't working a lot. And I was just thinking like, do I want to like focus on work and like stay in LA and like just do what I need to do and rebuild? And like, I just felt like where I saw my life going in like the next like five years wasn't exciting me. Or it didn't like, I just like, even if like, you know, I got back on like, building mad up and like doing like what I feel is easy to do here. I just don't see it as like something that's like, Oh my God. So I feel like moving to London is like, it's just a completely new and different path that could like go anywhere. Really. That's very, very perceptive. It's very perceptive to like, be like, Oh, to see like, okay, this is where I want to be. And this is not, this place isn't good. Like what, what's your like ultimate goal? Like, do you have like, is there an award that you want to win? Or is there like a a, a, a number, a person you want to style, a, a project? You know, like what's, you know, for like, let's say like music's like, oh, I want to win a Grammy. TV, I want to win an Emmy. Like, you know, or I want to have my own show. Uh, like what's your kind of... Um, I Honestly, I really don't... Um, it used to be like to make like a million in a year. And I did that. But I guess like, I, of course I... So casual. So very, very casual. <laughs> But I, I want to make millions every year. Like I want Matt to be big. I haven't I don't really care about like um like any like awards or anything in fashion. Cause like like I said, I really fell into this. But I do like I'm even like shifting kind of like how I want my business to be set up and like just like the way that I want to like put things out. And I feel like I'm just now coming to like realize like my full like not even my full potential but like just more of my potential and like what it has meant that I've done everything that I've done and like you know like I've really been outside looking at like what I did the past like six years or seven years for like a year now and like I'm just like oh wow like this is fire like you did amazing things whereas like when I was in it I was just in it so like I didn't really like realize like what I was doing for real so like now I just like see myself in like such a different way and like I just don't want to like be I also want to just shift the way I like think about money and like I feel like another big change in Matt specifically leaving LA and going to London is like I don't want my brand to be like Like, I could look at, like, what I did in 2020 and be like, okay, Matt is now capable of bringing in this amount a month, and we can, like, scale it to three times this by doing this and, like, selling these types of products and keeping this types of things on the website. And, like, you know, I don't really want to, like, chase money in that way, even though I know I could. I just want to, like, I want to, like, shift more into, like, being, like, really product-based and, like, Mm. more, like, artistic in, like, what I put out so that, like the value and like what I release like has more weight. 
You're, you're like Steve Jobs, like product focus. Uh, I think I'm like, maybe I'm growing into that. But yeah, I love Steve Jobs. Yeah, that's dope. I mean, I think that milestone is incredible. Um, has did anyone like? Because Matt's independent, right? Like, has anyone ever tried to like buy Matt and be like, "Oh, like y'all making this much?" Like, no, you know? I, had, I was thinking, like, somebody was talking to me recently about like selling it, like, and they were saying like it could be a good idea. And like, I do feel like I'm at a point where, like, I did a lot of work to build Matt, like for real, like for the longest. It's just me, like, literally making decisions. I had a business partner for like probably like the last like four years, but like. I or three or four years, but like I like really, even still with that, like it's like just the amount of like the fact that I design, creative direct the photo shoots, execute the photo shoots, cast the models, like just every hat that was worn, I wore it. So like it's just a lot of work. But and you taught yourself all that, right? Like you didn't go to school at TSU when you had one semester left. Like it wasn't in fashion, right? No, it was in media. Okay, I guess it's adjacent, but yeah, I mean, you tire. I mean, that's amazing. Well, okay, where can people find you? Okay, uh, I guess on Instagram. <laughs> my Instagram is my name backwards. Um, I remember I used to. Yes, yeah, I feel like people still call you like Ina. Like I remember I used to see him. Like people, people think that's your your your, your that's at your name. Yeah. Like your name backwards is your name forward. All right. Well, one thing when I keep the browser open because it has to like upload. Like don't like don't like. Closing, just like close. You know, you said you could manifest closing the laptop. I was like, don't close the laptop. <laughs> it needs to needs to upload for a second. But no, it was really great having you. We have to do this again. I love like I've always been a fan of yours from when I stumbled across you just like so long ago. And we both lived in New York, and we both lived in LA. But you know, also my, my car declined that one time, and I forgot the the J Cole tickets at the counter at the uh, at the gas station, um, which was I think that I think that's 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 what doomed our our, our uh, aborted relationship. But um. No, you're like such a, a superstar, and I think like you, like your story is so inspiring and unique. You know, it reminds me. It's like, you know, seeing. I think when you told me think about when you told me like you saw, I feel like seeing you seeing Destiny's Child performing like a high school gymnasium reminds me of like me seeing you on Tumblr. It's like oh, like me thinking like oh, like this girl's dope. Like she's gonna do something dope. Like she's you know like feeling like oh like. So that my my childhood is heavily influenced by early Beyonce, and that's just like it it um, it affected me a lot. Do you like the dance album? Do you like uh what's it called uh the recent one Renaissance was, Renaissance? I don't like it. I like it a lot actually. I'm a big Beyonce album in a long time. Though. That's fair. I'm a, I like I like the album, but um all right. Well, I liked it. This I like all the things that we covered. I fear I know for a fact like I don't know how much future watches what said about him online. I feel like I know Drake probably hears everything. I did my best, uh, you know, if you're listening to this, um, to to defend your honor. <laughs> but no, I really like the conversation that we had, and I can't wait to see you. And you know, I, I I have a British passport, so someday, you know. But um, and next, whenever you come back to LA or Houston, um, and also you're in Africa a lot, which I'm I'm I'm, I'm upset that Ghana kind of like, even though everyone listens to Afro beats, Nigerian artists, they go to Ghana. I'm like, come, like I know that Nigeria is a mess. So much nicer. The thing is, Nigeria is nice too. It's just that Nigeria is like, inf- like the government, the infrastructure. It's like that in Ghana too. But the really? thing about it is that Ghana is just like, it's just it's less people, and it's just like more tropical. Like it's like all across. Like right I am now. so I have legit. I met somebody who is actually half Nigerian, and she I asked her. She, she said she's never been to Nigeria, but she's been to Ghana. I was like, how have you not, like, how is Ghana? I've been to Nigeria, though. Okay, you went to Lagos? Yeah. You liked it? Or, yeah. I liked it. Um, I was okay. only there for, like, three days. I'm hoping to go back this month. Um, So right. I do want to see more, maybe next month. I went, like, Oh, low-key. Now I'm understanding why you live, why you moved to London. Because, like, it's such a, it's, you know, America to Nigeria or to Ghana is. Six hours. Yeah, London to London to London. Y'all, are, you're you're in the same time zone too. So yeah, that's dope. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, Easier with everything like even like going to uh, New York is just six hours. Like it's just a better place on the map of the world than LA, which is like disconnected from everything. It is. I flew from LA to South Africa, and also from yeah, from LA to South Africa, and it, it was like flying to Dubai takes like eighteen hours, and like you fly. Yeah. I was it's, thinking about going to Cape Town for. Cape Town's be- I've heard Cape Town's beautiful. I was in Johannesburg and I was like busy the whole time, so I didn't get to do too much. Yeah, but I went to Johannesburg to party and then Cape Town to chill. 
Okay, I like that. See, you're just such a jet setter. Where's, where's your favorite place you've been? Uh, I don't know. I love so many places. I love Bali. I love, I really like think about Bali. I just went to Gran Canaria in Spain. Like, last Oh, Spain week. is beautiful. I love Spain. I went to Spain when I was in. Barcelona was beautiful. I didn't really, <sighs> Amsterdam is beautiful, but I didn't really like it. Like I wouldn't rush to go back. The food wasn't good. Um, I love Paris. I just think Paris is just so cute. I, yeah, Paris is, I'm not a big traveler, but Paris, like, I went to uh, Spain when I was, like, 16. It was, like, part of a high school study abroad thing. And we, went to, we were, like, the only year where we didn't go to Barcelona, so I'm kind of salty about that. But we were, like, Sevilla, Valencia, Madrid. But we also traveled all around Spain, like, Cordoba, Cadiz, like, all these different cities around Spain, Avila, Segovia, like, these historical cities. Yeah, I'm and honestly sp- trying to learn Spanish so I can just go crazy over there. Yeah, I know a little bit of Spanish. I'll, I'll, I need to practice it. I'll, I'll, well, you could do Duolingo, but I, we, we could practice together. Um yeah, Spain is dope. I need to go to Paris. Um, all right, well, this has been a pleasure. Hi, We're going to do this again. Great. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, let me know how it goes. Good luck on your podcast. Thank you. You're gonna you're gonna be the reason you're gonna be the reason it takes off. Yeah, we're gonna get we're gonna we're gonna be that Joe Rogan call her dad. Well, it's not about the money, but that Joe Rogan call her daddy audience. That's what we're gonna get. Um, that size. All right. All right. Thank you for coming. All right. Bye.